call the meeting to order. Certainly. Uh, Van Bardoff is absent. Jeffrey is absent. Terry Allison. Present. Teresa Keene. Present. Mickey Matley is present. Cheryl McGuire. Here. Helen McGuire. Here. Bill Vosberg is absent. Tim Wolf. Present. Mm -hmm. So we have a quorum first, and our agenda is the approval of the agenda for our August 23rd, 2021 regular Board of Education meeting. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda, the consent agenda, to add item, in item F, the so, uh, support staff retirement of Mary Rip, cafeteria worker, Parkside, and in G, pro professional staff resignation, add Kristen Hartley, uh, MS uh, Middle School English. A motion was made by Tim to amend the agenda to the consent items to include items F and G. Do I have a second? I'll second the amendment. Motion was made by Tim and seconded by Nikki to approve the amended agenda um, for our the Board of Education meeting on August 23rd, 2021. All those in favor by voice vote say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. On to the consent items. We have a number of um, consent items. We have to approve the minutes from the board meeting on August 9th, 2021. <clears throat> um, approval of receipts and expenditures both June and July 2021. Approval of a staff hiring. We have Melinda Half, um, Abraham Lincoln Elementary Educational Assistant. Amy Heiler, High School Educational Assistant, Daniela Ortiz, Parkside Educational Assistant, Courtney Jermiason, Northside Educational Assistant, Shelly Holland, Middle School Educational Assistant, um, approval of professional staff hiring, Lisa Duffy, Abraham Lincoln First Grade, Jennifer Cox, Middle School Math Interventionist, and Brian Campbell, um, High School English. I want to congratulate and welcome all of them to the district. Really excited to have all of them join us. Um, approval and acceptance of community donations. We're always ex incredibly grateful and appreciative of the incredible community support that we have. So thank you to the Monroe Bible Church for their donation of school supplies, as well as the Monroe Noon Optimist for their school supply donations. And then we have to... Um, Add the retirement of Mary Ripp, cafeteria worker at Parkside Elementary, and resignation of Kristen um, Hartlib as a middle school English teacher. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Second. A motion by Tim and a second by Terry to approve the consent items as presented by voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. All right, so we have um, public comment. And we had people sign in. Um, if there are people who want to make public comments, I want to remind people that um, we are a meeting held in public, but not a public meeting. So we welcome public comment. We welcome input. But while we may not interact with you or talk with you, we are listening and we are hearing what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to start with the list, and once we get through this list, if there's people who didn't have a chance to sign up, um, you, may, you may have an option to, to provide public comment as well. Comments are limited to five minutes, and they need to be um, related to topics that we're going to take business on and be talking about for the school board. So with that, um, Claire Lees. Good evening. I, um... I wanted to speak tonight so you're able to match a name from an email with at least half a face, and I promise that's my last lame joke tonight. Um, as a nurse, I've already emailed you with CDC guidelines and scientific evidence. Tonight, I speak as a parent of an unvaccinated second grader who has never experienced a normal school year, and her education has suffered for it. We also have an immunocompromised family member we must protect. It is these competing concerns that drive me here tonight. I am appealing to you based on a shared sense of responsibility for the health of our children and our community. A responsibility I know you share because of your dedicated and sometimes thankless service on the school board. It's because of a shared sense of responsibility 
that public school exists in the first place. Just ask the property taxpayers who don't have children in the district. It's because of a shared sense of responsibility that there are various requirements in public schools, from standard childhood vaccinations to disciplinary procedures to random mandatory drug testing without parental consent. An indoor mask requirement is no different. It's because of a shared sense of responsibility that all visitors are background checked upon entering our schools, a violation of their right to privacy to try to protect our students. Students have regular Alice drills, fire drills, tornado drills, proactive measures designed to protect them. When was the last time there was a school shooting in the district? A fire in a district building, a tornado that hit a district building. Because of the absence or rarity of these events, is it controversial in the district that we have measures in place to address them? Not really. Now, when was the last time a student in the district was sickened with COVID-19? A teacher, a staff member. We don't need a large number of people close to us to be hospitalized or die in order to know that COVID carries those risks. Just as we don't need to experience a school shooting to take precautionary measures. Unfortunately, you don't have the power to protect all students or their family members from suffering COVID-related disability or death. The tools that you have are imperfect. The information you have is imperfect. And I completely recognize that. Um, students will be coming back at full capacity in the fall, and I support that. But that means you keep the tools that you have to support in-person learning. You require indoor masking because you don't know what impact full capacity schooling during a Delta surge will have. You can't know who or how many will suffer hospitalization, disability, or death. You don't know how quickly schools may become overwhelmed with COVID infections, if at all. I believe that when this year is over, you'll want to look back and know that you did what was within your power to prevent the worst outcomes for our children. I have reviewed the short version of the COVID-19 policies, and I am concerned about the visitor policy and the quarantining policy for vaccinated persons. Since recent studies on the Delta variant have shown that vaccinated people have the same level of virus in their system as unvaccinated persons. But my concern is lessened with an indoor mask requirement. Based on the information that is coming out about the Delta variant, I am now concerned that last school year was just our dress rehearsal for the COVID show that is coming. We've practiced this. We know how it's done. Please let's use the tools that we have that we know are protective to support full in-person learning. Required indoor masking, distancing as much as possible, cohorting, improved building ventilation, encouraging vaccinations for the eligible, Across the country, we are seeing a preview of the consequences of an individual approach to this virus. School closures in Georgia, hospitals overwhelmed in Texas. This virus is not an individual problem. It thrives where choices are individualized. This virus can only be controlled by a shared sense of responsibility. To the community, to the public schools, to the children whose health and education we protect. Thank you for your time and attention. All right, thank you. Cami Blackburn. <clears throat> so my name is Cami Blackburn. I have three daughters in the district. I spoke with you earlier in the spring as well through a Zoom call. Um, I was really struggling in deciding if I wanted to speak again tonight. You see, I'm often afraid to speak my truth lately for fear of being view viewed as selfish or uncaring towards others simply because of my views. For those who know me, they know that I'm an empathetic, loving, nurturing, kind person, but not everyone knows me. However, I do believe that everyone has a right to speak their truth. Our right to expression is critical in our physical and mental health. Our voices matter, and with our voices, we can inspire the world. We can help others. 
So tonight, I will be speaking my truth. In regards to quarantine, when it comes to masked or not masked students, I have a few questions. Are you not concerned about the health of those students who choose to wear a mask? Are you not concerned about their safety in the same way that you are about those students who choose to wear a mask? Don't these families who are doing what they think is best to keep their children safe deserve the same safety protocols as the families who are also doing what they think is best when they choose not to wear a mask? Do they not deserve to be notified of a close contact so that they can then do the right thing and quarantine so that they can have that peace of mind that they're not spreading COVID to their peers, teachers, and family members? Also, who is held responsible if a student wearing a mask tests positive after having close contact, but they were not quarantined due to your policy? That student who is not quarantined by your standards could contract and transmit COVID to other students, staff, and family members. Because anyone who has the slightest bit of understanding of how viruses work knows that the number one way that a virus enters the body is through your eyes. And masks do not cover the eyes. Don't these students deserve the same level of concern when it comes to their health and their family's health? I also wanted to bring up some concerns that I had witnessed during the last few months of the last, the last school year. And I can see that it could be a problem in returning to school this fall. I had the opportunity to listen in on um, many of my daughter's classes, as all three of them were in plan age. And specifically in my oldest daughter's high school classes, I was surprised at how often teachers were pressuring her children to get the COVID vaccine. I'm not here to argue about the vaccine. I support everyone who gets or doesn't get it. However, teachers are using their position of authority to give medical advice to minors. I heard several teachers tell their classes that they needed to get the vaccine and do their part to stop this pandemic and basically shaming those students who are even brave enough to give a different opinion than that of the adult in the room. I also know of teachers and coaches that have recently asked students if they've been vaccinated or not in front of their peers. This is unacceptable and it puts our children in a very difficult situation, no matter if they've been vaccinated or not. I wanna bring this to your attention because you may not even be aware that it's happening. And I also want you to know um, or I, I want to know how you're going to address this issue with both staffs and students. How are you going to protect our students' medical information when some teachers are using that authority to get this private information from our students? And the last point that I want to address with you, and I'm sure that you're aware, is the importance of giving students and staff the choice to wear a mask during the school day. You get to make a choice tonight. You get to choose whether our students and staff, specifically in the elementary schools, will be forced to wear masks. Your choice could potentially take away their choice. Your choice could remove their rights and their freedom to make medical decisions that are best for them. Those who want personal choice are not asking to take away the other's rights to choose for themselves. However, those that want to mandate masks for everyone are asking you to believe that, the, that their choice is best for everyone. And if I'm speaking my truth, I would tell you that their request sounds selfish to me. Um, John Witt. Can I sit in the chair? Right? You can stand or sit anywhere you would like. My name is John Witt. I am an employee of the district. I work at the high school maintenance and in charge of our custodians. Um, the board's probably wondering what's going to come out of my mouth tonight. I tell you what I'm going to talk about. It's going to come from my heart. All right. I, I up to the middle of February of last year, this sorry, this year was the most aggressive enforcer of the policies the district had in place in our school. I'd be walking down the hallway and the students would have their mask on their chin. Go, come on, get your mask up, get your mask up. Okay. Um, social distancing, walking single file down the hallway. All right. I'd make sure they would do that. Lunchroom behavior, all that kind of stuff. That's where I was up to the middle of February. I almost bought into this lie that's going around this world. Almost. I was that close. A few weeks later in March, I had, or sorry, March 19th, February 19th, I had hernia surgery. Laid me up for five weeks. Did a lot, a lot of research. A lot, a lot of, okay, a lot of research. I walked through the high school without a mask 
in early part of March and got formally written up when the students got a verbal warning first. So that's where I came from. I even would call Jeff Newcomer up during a basketball game on YouTube watching the fans that aren't social distancing. I go, Jeff, come on, why don't you get those guys, spread them out a little bit. John, just calm down a little bit, calm down a little bit. That's where I was. Not anymore, I got woke. I got some concerns here about our quarantines, vax versus unvaxed. My wife Heidi sent Rick an email. We just asked, why the difference? Why is someone deemed close contact with a positive person that's not vaxxed has to be quarantined for 10 days? And the one that's vaxxed is fine. Where's the science? Show us the science. I don't understand that. That is discrimination. Mm -hmm. Flat out discrimination. I, I just don't understand that. Same with our student athletes. Okay, Cammy brought it up earlier. I witnessed a coach ask a group of kids, Who's been vaxxed here? Who hasn't been vaxxed here? You know what the blur they yelled out? We all have but him. Where's the privacy in that? Where is the right to even ask that question? I don't, I don't understand that. I mean, it, it just makes no sense to me that this is being allowed. Okay? I'm going to tell you right now, I'll take a bullet before I get vaxxed. That's how I feel about it. I know what's in it. You guys know what mRNA is all about? Never been tested on human beings before. Everyone that took that jab is the test. You're the guinea pigs. Flat out. Gain of function. Spike protein. You guys know what spike protein is doing in red blood cells? Exactly that. They're spiking them. They're not round anymore. I've seen macroscopic images of it. All over the world. Doctors all over the world. Providing all this information. <coughs> Why aren't we guys, are you guys seeing it? Because mainstream media is suppressing it. They're part of the problem. Flat out, part of the problem. Start listening to doctors that are researching all over the world. Um, mask. Masks are a medical device, according to the FDA in the cosmetic section. It's buried in there, but it's a, it's a medical device. As such, you cannot mandate anyone to wear a medical device. Can't. You just can't. I'm going to read something. I don't know. School board, I sent you an email last Monday. I know you guys can't talk back. Raise a hand, mate. Who read that email from me? Anybody? Okay. Newenberg Codes. I'm only going to read the first one. Voluntary consent of the human suffrage is absolutely essential. This means that that person involved should have legal capacity to give consent should be situated to, as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element or force of force. Fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved, as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. This met latter element requires that before the acceptance of an affirmative decision by the experimental subject, there should be made known to him a nature, duration, purpose of the experiment, the method and means on which it is to be conducted, all inconveniences, hazards reasonably to be expected, and the effects upon this, his health or a person which may possibly come from his participation in the experiment. The duty and responsibility for ascertaining the quality of the consent rests upon each individual who initiates, directs, or engages in the experiment. It is a personal duty and responsibility which may not be delegated to any other puny. That is you guys. You have 30 administration. Seconds. Just giving you a warning. 30 seconds. Okay. You're good. That being said, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to give you legal notice of violation of the Nuremberg Code on medical ex experimentation. I do hereby exercise my right to refuse submittal to administer the COVID 19 experimental gene therapy injection, heretofore known as COVID 19 vaccine. The United States government has extraterritorial prosecuted, convicted, and executed medical doctors who have violated the Nuremberg Code on medical experimentation. Aiders and embedders of Nuremberg crimes are equally guilty and have also been prosecuted, convicted, and executed. That'd be you guys. Thank you, John. I got to finish this. And you're no, you don't. You're at your five John, minutes. John, you're at your five minutes. Okay. Everybody gets five minutes. And Pete Schmidt.
name is Peter Schmidt. Um, I'll just, I won't start the timer yet, but I will kind of, so I didn't say this before, but I will kind of raise my hand with, to give you a 30 second timer so people kind sure. of know, just, just a visual. Thank right. you. Yep, go ahead. <clears throat> um, I would like to address the Monroe Board of Education by asking a few simple questions. I understand that you will not be answering these questions, but my hope is to help people understand how the decisions that will be made here tonight could not only further separate an already divided school district, but could be setting our students up for an environment that will be encouraging bullying and harassment based on opinions, not of their own, but of their parents. The idea that you would even consider quarantining a student who does not wear a mask and not quarantine a student wearing a mask, once again, shows how ignorant we are being to how virus are truly transmitted and how human physiology truly works. My first question I will ask the board is, do you understand that all viruses can be passed from one individual to another through the eyes? If you do understand this basic process, then why would a person wearing a mask be any more protected than a person not wearing a mask? Especially with the younger students, we all know touch their faces, which include their eyes constantly. Wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. By quarantining the student not wearing masks and not quarantining the student wearing a mask, you are directly not looking out for the safety of the student wearing the mask. As somebody said earlier, if somebody contact traces with somebody and they're wearing a mask, if I'm sitting next to this woman right here and she's wearing a mask and I'm not, and he tests positive, she's just as vulnerable as I am because her eyes are exposed. And nobody wants to take a look at that. We just, we just want to bury our heads in the sand about that one basic physiological fact that occurs. Every virus can get transmitted through your eyes. So I would like the board to explain to us how you plan on protecting people who are wearing a mask, but their eyes are exposed. <clears throat> um, So kids are constantly um, touching their face, um, mask or no mask. By quarantining the student not wearing a mask, and not quarantining the student wearing a mask, we're directly not looking out for the safety of the student wearing the mask. Um, are they not as vulnerable? Mr. Waski, in the last meeting, admitted that even though last year everyone was wearing a mask, the school still experienced a number of bre breakout cases of SARS-CoV-2. So we wore a mask last year. Somebody said we did a practice run last year. We did a practice run to prove that you'd be wearing masks and still out breakout cases. So once again, proves he really didn't help. My next question has to do with student anti-harassment code in our school policy. I thought this school district was about acceptance. Why would we cause a divide in our student population just because of a belief if a mask works or not, or if a, a, a student chooses to wear a mask or not? You get Everybody's talking about, we really want to keep everybody accepted, no bullying, no harassment. You're going to set up a situation, we're going to have a lot of that. And it's going to be with the younger kids. Um, finally, it was brought to my attention that the board is choosing to follow some of the CDC recommendations, but not all of them. So I'd like to know who on this board has any medical expertise to make a choice on what you should choose to use and what you're choosing not to use. I'd like to know where that metal expertise comes from and, and what parameters you're using. We're going to pick this. We're not going to pick that. What are you basing that on? Um, I was led to believe that overall student safety was first and foremost when making decisions about the upcoming school year. Clearly, this is not the case. We are willing to sacrifice the health of some students by ignoring basic principles of viral transmission and pick and choose which CDC guidelines we want to use based on if they fit the agenda we're trying to push through this school district. Thank you very much. Marsha Simler. And I apologize if I said your last name wrong. Nope, that's right. <laughs> well, this is a first, and my son is going to come. He was called into work. I'm Marcia Simler. I'm a certified natural health practitioner. I have thousands of clients around here in Monroe. I had a um, clinic in Verona for a long time using all what God's herbs are out there. And I have uh, a few of your teachers that come to me to use God's herbs to help the body with the immune system. 
And I wondered why, if not more, shouldn't be doing this because they, again, didn't want to have their kids come even to um, summer school because they had to wear a mask. And I have a seven uh, and a nine year old. And one of the times last year, he asked to go to a corner to breathe because he couldn't breathe after a um, session of gym and another time at recess. And he said another kid got to do it, but he didn't. And I said, that's horrible. When your oxygen input uh, is supposed to be at 100, and you'll know it with nurses and whatever, um, when they wear a mask, it goes down to 70 to 80 percent. You're sucking in viruses because those masks don't work unless you have a triple quadruple mask. It, the viruses actually go through those masks. And it's a proven fact on the box of the ones that they give out commercially, it says not for viral use. I don't know if you've seen the box or not. So it's very interesting, even the people in surgery that have those masks on, they have to have more oxygen input into that hospital surgery room to help those people who have masks on. So you're getting not the carbon dioxide out for breathing out to help the body heal. Another question is why did Freeport, Judah, Broadhead, Monticello, New Glarus, kids not have to wear a mask. I almost transferred our kids to that. There's some parents thinking about going that route. Again, if, again, you guys make mask a requirement. Now, if the parents want to do it and the kids want to do it, I, I'd say go ahead and do it. But again, they're, they're hurting their own body for oxygen, that everything, the cells are needed for that. And again, you know, there's going to be a lot of transfers, there's going to be a lot of homeschools, and it's just going to bite you guys for, I don't know how much you get for a student, I don't know any of that. I just was talked about this today, I don't even have notes, but even uh, Dr. Tenpenny, she should look her up, 200,000 people died as of today or more on the CDC list for having the uh, virus shot within one week. Now. 240 kids died of the flu in that 2018-2019 school year. And how many died of COVID? 0.0008%. So COVID is 99.732% to get over it. I have thousands of clients. I've wrote for health magazines. I got books written about me. A lady had three months to live and she's 13 years into it at, um, in Phoenix. Uh, I've got uh, heart transplants um, that didn't have to have a heart transplant we just by using God stuff. I talked up at the um, Capitol about that when they pay a $700,000. It's up to $2 million now for a heart transplant and with vitamin E and other things like that. So I think we should be more educational on their immune system. We should be more educating on maybe using purification oil in a room instead of that kills germs more than anything. And that's what God put out there again. And different little alternatives to help these kids with health and their immune system. What are they eating? All the sugar. What are they eating? All the toxic foods. Uh, all the foods are turning into GMO right now. They should do organic foods. But I don't want to get off on a tangent. I just want to give you these information of what I've used for over 30 years. I'm over 72 years old. My clients won't let me uh, retire because of all the awesome things going on. But... If you have a situation, why not look into both sides of it instead of just, you have to wear a mask, you have to be vaccinated. I would never be vaccinated. My dad got vaccinated and he died two months later. And that wasn't supposed to because my mom was at LPN. And uh, yeah, I'm 30 sorry. seconds. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how to finish this. I don't have any notes, but I have so many things I was going to say. And there's so many things that I think you should look and find out the real facts of this pandemic. That's what it is. It's to take the people that have a problem out of the world, and I hope God comes back to help us. But again, I appreciate your efforts on, on thinking about some other items, thinking about our kids, and if they want a mask, they can mask. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I 
I'm Kelly Polk, and we have four kids in the school district. We have four, or three in elementary and one in the middle school. And I do want to thank the board for sitting here through all of this. And it's not easy on either side, the parents' side or the board side, I'm sure. But um, I know there's a lot of anger in the room tonight. There's a lot of anger in, in the country over this topic because it's, it's a very divided topic and a lot of strong feelings both ways. And I feel for both sides because I understand that some kids are immune compromised and we have two kids that have asthma. But I also want to teach my kids that even if there's something that's a policy or mandated by, by authority, that you have the right to ask questions. You have the right to, if something doesn't feel right, you have the right to look into it, ask questions, do your own research, and then stand up for what you believe. And my husband and I do not believe that the kids should be in masks most off because there's no, even the CDC website, they have an illustration of the different size particles and they had a <clears throat> wildfire particle. It was like the size of a, a playground ball. And they said, surgical masks and cloth masks do not filter out this wildfire particle. Then way down at the very end, smaller than a marble was a COVID virus. So if it's not filtering out the big stuff, it's not going to filter out the little stuff. And then also, it obviously, kids touch their face all the time. That's the number one thing they tell you not to do when you want to try to not spread germs. And the, the last thing with masks is that it really doesn't increase the kids' stress level, I believe. My kids, um, just looking at what, what they come home with and what they say, I've asked them before, are you afraid of COVID? They say no. And are you afraid of getting in trouble about your mask? And there's a pause. So if they forget their mask, there's more of a panic alert than, and I've said that before, than if like they forgot their library books or they forgot their lunch. It's, they're, they're more afraid of complying. And that, that worries me. As far as the vaccine goes, um, before the shutdown even hit the United States, I watched uh, Dr. John Bergman, um, chiropractor, and his, his research said that they've been trying to develop a vaccine for the common cold, which is also coronavirus, since 2003. And they first obviously start with animals, and they, they had a great immune response to the COVID, or to, I'm sorry, the common cold. But the vaccine um, destroyed what was left of their immune system. So it never made it to human study. So basically, they were immune to the, the common cold, but then anything else that they were exposed to after that, would, which would normally have not killed them, killed the animals. So that is a huge concern for me when I hear middle school aged kids getting this vaccine, especially because they're too young to be making that kind of decision when they don't have the research or even know to do the research. So <clears throat> the rush on this vaccine, the amount of push uh, nationwide, the amount of push on this vaccine scares me. It, I listened to another doctor that said that there's nothing, um, there's, there can't be a vaccine that's effective that the, the virus lives also in animals. And if you think about it, like the swine flu, the bird flu, there's no vaccine for those. They don't, they don't reside just in humans. Um, there are a lot of whistleblowers that you, doctors, nurses, pediatricians, and I feel for them because they're putting their, their, life, their license on the line to try to save kids that they care about, especially pediatricians I've watched, um, saying that Kids that are injected with this, they're seeing strokes and heart attacks. You just don't see that kind of thing in kids. And with the swine flu, they, sh Thank you. they shut down the vaccine program after 26 deaths. And with this, we're, I think it's just in the US, we're well over 11,000 and they're full steam ahead. And I think we need to start asking why. There's a lot of questions we need to start asking why. Like, why are we getting free handouts from the government? Why are we getting free lunches? 
what direction is our nation going in? We're divided and it's sad. So then it looks like Wes, is that right, Wes Folk? Yep. I'll uh, try to avoid duplicate bullet points. But, uh, so Wes Folk, father of four in the Monroe School District, very happy to be part of this group. Um, my comments are specific to mask mandates. So I personally am strongly opposed to mask mandates, and I'd like to share, share why. First off, they're simply not required for a virus with a 99.8 or 99.7% survival rate with the age groups that we're talking about. That's just ridiculous. Um, they don't work, especially with kids. I know it's been said a couple times, but I'm going to say it again for the sake of this group and everyone on YouTube who are listening. Think about the nature of kids, right? You touch everything. You touch your face. You touch your eyes. They don't work. Um, you're going to be in direct contact with your eyes and spread it more significantly. I think if anything, it makes it worse. Um, another one that's also been pointed out several times, right? Mask disc reduce the critical oxygen supply needed for healthy, active kids and learning. Um, I know I personally have saw a very frustrated daughter over this. She comes home with headaches. She's concerned. And then a personal experience of my own, I, I make it a point to hit the steps at work. I do not take elevators. I'm not going to say I'm a health addict by any means, but I do get exercise. And when I hit three flights of steps that I've been hitting for 20 years with a mask on and found myself going, wow, I can't breathe. That was an eye opener. Um, another point I want to make, and I'll make it um, recent CDC guidelines to mask indoors are based on an unreleased study out of India. We can all do our own research, but the study was rejected at a peer review, and then within 24 hours, that status was covered up, and they published it as their science behind the masking indoors at this point in time. So I would encourage everyone to check into that. Um, anyone that has used masks for construction know how ineffective they are for stopping construction debris dust. That in itself is evidence they're not going to stop a virus particle, the size of a no particle. And uh, I want to be clear that even though I'm opposed to it, anyone that wants to wear it and feel comfortable, I am you know, your choice. I'm not opposed to that by any means. That's your choice. Don't want to take that away from you. With respect to the vaccine, I just want to encourage everyone to do their own research. Make the best choice for you. Um, for me personally, there's no way I'm going to sign up for a high-risk vaccination with an extremely low-risk virus. There's absolutely no way. I'd also like to share that at my place of employment, the last three positive cases, so we went... Uh, I think it was about an eight-week period where masks were not required if you voluntarily provided evidence of vaccination. And uh, the, there was a six, eight-week period where there was no cases. Then we did have three cases, two of which were vaccinated individuals. The hallway I chat or I heard is it hit them harder than the non-vaccinated individual. Um, so again, I encourage everyone to talk to family and friends, get information from people you trust, not the mainstream media. Um, I guess in summary, I'm strongly opposed to the mandate, the mass mandate specifically. There's no scientific evidence that they help children or anyone for that matter with respect to the virus. And uh, if nothing else, I strongly encourage everyone to reach out to family and friends to do their own research regarding real world impact, the real world impact of COVID. Don't believe everything the media is covering. Uh, the last thought I had here was, I don't fault anyone's for decisions made in the spring of 2020 with all the unknown and the fear. But I do fault those who continue to make poor decisions when the data argues otherwise. Thanks for your time. Well, Good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. What I'm about to say is different than anything else you've heard so far. Um, I strongly believe in science. I strongly believe in the effectiveness of the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccines. I've had my shots, and my 86-year-old significant other has had his shots. And thank God um, we have been safe so far. I'm looking at what's happening in the southern part of the United States where people were very reluctant to get the vaccinations. 
And it seems to me that the hospitals uh, in Texas and Florida, Georgia, places where people were less likely to be vaccinated, um, their hospitals are being overrun right now and they don't have emergency room beds. The state of Alabama is out. And you may say, well, Barb, that's mainstream news. How can you possibly believe that? But thank goodness we aren't patients there. Thank goodness nobody is having a heart attack there or here. It has to be serviced in those, those hospitals that are overrun. The reason I bring this up is because um, there is the ability of viruses to mutate. And they will mutate as long as there are people who are, are not vaccinated. As long as we're running around and have a large group that is unvaccinated, that's perfect area for those vax for the um, for the vaccines to change. And what I'm concerned about, uh, it it affects not just the kids, but the teachers and the staff. Um, First of all, if, if the virus mutates to a point that our vaccines are ineffective, there's no telling how many of us could die because you can't change the vaccines that fast to keep up with the mutations because we, we haven't been getting vaccinated fast enough to stop the mutations. And secondly, it seems to me, you know, about the kids, oh, you can't breathe with a mask on and that kind of thing. We ask a small sacrifice from teachers, staff, and kids right now at the beginning of the year to protect one another, to safe distance, to do what we can so that school can run and, and kids don't have to be homeschooled. If it's a lot easier to start with the masks on and to gradually be able to, re to relax um, the mandates than it is to say, oh boy, now we've got a major rampant virus infection in the school and now we've got to shut down. And I know people who can't, who, who if people are not masked or aren't vaccinated, they can't even come to school because it's just too dangerous. Anyhow, I know that isn't appealing to what most of you here think but it very well may be appealing to what most in the school district think. Anyhow, blessings and thank you for hearing me out. Um, yep, Kevin Vissel, am I saying that correctly? Vissel. Vissel, sorry, thank you. Well, thank you to all of you who serve on the board. I know it's not easy, and we appreciate your service. I'm keeping a promise to my son tonight that I would stand up for him and be his voice. For his sake and for others, I feel compelled to offer some perspective. Our family, like many others, has experienced some incredibly dark and difficult times with health issues. Vaccine injury in particular left a mark on our family, bringing about long-lasting side effects and complications including severe asthma attacks, psoriasis, pulmonary arterial hypertension, IBS, interstitial cystitis, several others. Many of the symptoms our children experience can be directly triggered or exacerbated by wearing a facial mask. And this is not some half-cooked crazy conspiracy theory. This is the real life of our children. I am happy to report that today our children are once again able to eat, sleep, breathe, run, function as healthy children should. If we had continued with the generally accepted medical advice, I'm certain this would not be the case. And I don't blame any doctor for this, just that nobody cares for their child quite like a parent. So I can tell you from experience, the parents must be the decision makers for their children's health. Children are entrusted by their creator to no authority higher than their parents, not to the state, the CDC, or a school board, but to their parents. The only way for a school to respect the proper role of a parent is to allow choice, informed consent on issues of bodily health. For this reason, I applaud your leadership in respecting the proper role of a parent by making mask wearing optional for students this year. I am concerned, however, by suggestions that this position could change. I understand concerns of liability and safety that would lead us to pin our decisions to 
those of some perceived higher authority like the county or other school districts or the CDC, but I will suggest to you if we're going to pin our decisions on a higher authority, look still higher to the authority that deemed it proper to place children under the care of their parents. If liability is a concern, you know liability can come from any direction. Last year was marked by confusion, many of us doing the best we could with the information we had. Many drastic measures were taken. Some of those drastic measures, if continued, could be considered institutionalized if they are repeated this year. I'd suggest that you not institutionalize discrimination of any kind. But there are two in particular. Discrimination based on health factors was outlawed by HIPAA in 1996. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination on the ground of religion. And that word religion does not mean what church you go to or don't go to. Dictionary.com says, something one believes in and follows devotedly, a point of matter, point or matter of ethics or conscience. Religion is defined by personal moral convictions. We might not think of mass in terms of religion, but this is certainly an area of moral conviction for all of us. So will you tell my children that they must do things with their bodies that violate their own moral convictions? Would you like me to require that of your children? Perhaps we've been so distracted by the whole mask or no mask debate that we've forgotten that we all already know that it is wrong to force others to violate their own conscience. It always has been wrong and it always will be. Is bullying okay if it keeps someone else safe? And what is bullying if not forcing people to do what they would not in good conscience do? I believe that the religious principles that I live by are powerful to save lives. I really do. But if I force those religious practices on you, or any other practice that involves your conscience and your body, I would be a bully to say the least. We don't tolerate bullying from our students. We should not model it to them, especially to K through five. Do you think that you have authority to determine what my child breathes through? Soon you'll have to decide whether to demand access to my child's bloodstream. Where exactly is the line where your authority ends and my child's bodily autonomy begins? Do you know? scientifically, legally, morally? I do. That line is drawn at any part of my child's body. My child's nose and mouth are his breath, his lungs, his heart. This, tonight, is where you, as leaders, must draw the line. Providing options is the only possible decision that is kind, compassionate, and morally just. So I ask you to please recognize this and do the right thing. Thank you. Stacy Kavanaugh. First, my husband David and I would like to recognize the incredible work that our teachers did last year. We appreciate the dedication of our school personnel and affirm the absolute necessity of in person instruction for both our teachers and our students. We listened in on all of the school board meetings last year. We appreciated the robust discussion and the careful consideration of science that you used last year in making decisions. We trusted that when changes were recommended, the board would respond using the same criteria. However, discussions lately about masks optional for elementary school students disturb us. None of our elementary stu students are vaccinated. And this did not follow the recommendations from the CDC, DHS, or Greene County Health Department that we'd come to expect. Although most of the school district personnel are vaccinated, only a little over half of the population in the zip code and school district are vaccinated. The Delta variant is spreading rapidly among the unvaccinated. We watched the cases in the schools last year, and the vector of spread comes from unvaccinated adults who pass the virus to unvaccinated children in their household. So even though our daughter is masked and has two vaccinated parents, she is at risk if exposed to an unmasked child of unvaccinated parents. Their decisions don't impact just their family, but the whole community. As a pastor and community leader, I have been part of making difficult decisions with ever shifting protocols without the benefit of mandates from higher bodies. I know what it's like to be an outlier. The leadership team at my church has been deliberate and clear 
about following the science. We were the last church in town to open our building. We are the only ones who've never stopped social distancing and masking. Theologically, we understand that this is fulfilling the commandment to love our neighbors and to protect the most vulnerable in our midst. We have 18 children in our congregation who are too young to receive vaccinations. We also know that we have medically fragile people in our community. You have these same populations in the elementary <laughs> schools. Although I am not a medical doctor, I pay attention to the guidelines from professionals. From the CDC, on May 23rd, the provisional update from the CDC stated that fully vaccinated people could return to normal activities. All non-vaccinated people should be masked. This never changed. None of our children in the elementary school are eligible for vaccinations, and their short board should be masked if you're following national guidelines. On July 27th, the CDC recommended universal masking for everyone regardless of vaccination status when community spread is substantial or high. We reached substantial on August 10th, high on August 12th. We have stayed at these two levels ever since. As of 2 p.m. this afternoon, 54.3% of the population in the 53566 zip code and 53.8% of the population in the Monroe School District are fully vaccinated. I've been watching this metric on a weekly basis. It took us a month to move one percentage point. These numbers tell us more about risk vectors than the activity numbers of burden and trajectory that we had to rely on last year. Nevertheless, on August 18th, we were at a high burden with no significant change in trajectory. If you watch the weekly numbers of the active cases in the county published by Green County Public Health, you will notice that even though the numbers of active cases in the county were minimal through most of June and July, the numbers of people ever hospitalized was increasing. In July, the percentages of new cases that were ever hospitalized hovered around 20 to 30 percent. Though there were few active cases, those cases were serious. Since August 4th, we've watched the numbers of active cases in the county rise significantly to a high of 39 new cases last week. On Tuesday, August 10th, the Greene County Public Health Department issued a press release stating Greene County had moved to substantial transmission, transmission and therefore universal masking regardless of vaccination status is recommended. With this information, I implore you as a board to add universal masking to our elementary school students until such a time when our children are eligible for vaccinations. I ask you to give those parents who choose the opportunity to have our children fully vaccinated before you relax this guideline. It follows the science, it decreases the likelihood of educational interruptions for quarantines, and it is the least we can do to protect our young children. Is there anybody else who is interested in making a public comment? Please, you can come sign in. We'll take people one at a time. Oh, you can go next then. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's no. okay. Come on up. We prefer you both sign in and then we'll Everyone, call your yep. names. Actually, that's a great idea. So anybody who wants to give a public comment, if you could come sign in, then we'll continue to call names. Good idea. We do need the address and the location because only okay. district residents can speak. Yeah, you might want to just, yeah. Oh, I guess that'll be the pseudo podium. <laughs> Just a reminder for the people who've been here a little bit later, you're limited to five minutes and it has to be on something that's uh, on the board's agenda to uh, take action on. Of course, everything so far today certainly has. So. I 
I, I saw that too. Leaving that. Deb Crediger. Again, thank you tonight for the opportunity to speak to you. I apologize up front because I was not prepared to speak to you tonight, but I feel very compelled to do so. Some of you, I'm going to look familiar to you because I spoke to you last spring at one of your Zoom meetings, and I spoke and addressed the <laughs> issue of mass and the effects that it has on our children in their development, in their lung, their lung capacity, their breathing capacity, the issues that can come from that. Putting a mask on children, it, it inhibits their ability to develop empathy. They can't see expressions. So that, we've already talked about that, so I'm not going to go into that. But I am, I am going to go back to what John Witt was speaking to, and he talked about mass as defined as a medical device. And he began to speak to you about the Nuremberg Codes. And I'm going to finish reading that notice for him because he ran out of time. But again, masking, the masks are a device. I also want to just quickly talk about vaccine clinics. I know you had a vaccine. I don't know if you call it that. But you had one scheduled sometime in August, I believe it was. But due to lack of interest, it was canceled. Please, before you ever, ever, ever consider promoting a vaccine clinic in our schools again, on our taxpayer dollar, think twice about it. Because it violates every single Nuremberg Code that's out there. And I don't want you to be liable for that. Who's going to sleep at night when our first child in our school district gets injured from one of these shots? When we hear about numbers about the people that are rising, numbers in the hospital, I have a very close family friend who works in the Phoenix hospital system. She was a COVID nurse that toured, worked, not toured, worked in several hospitals in the Phoenix area throughout the last 18 months. I just received a message from her the other day. She said, Deb, I want to share with you what's going on in a hospital that I work in right now. She said, this is the narrative that is being put out there. The unvaccinated are 90% of the patients who are in the hospital and are doing the worst. However, in admissions, when a, person, a patient comes in and they are asked, are you vaccinated? And if the person says yes, you know what it gets listed as? Unknown. If they are vaxxed, I don't know, I, I got to repeat that again. I don't know if I said it right. If they have, if they've been, if they've unvaccinated, I have wrote it down. If they're vaxxed, it's listed as unknown. So what's happening is the reporting numbers are not showing that the majority of the people that are in the hospitals right now have had the vax. That's what I want you to look into. I beg you to look into that. Let me finish reading the legal notice that John was about to share. By authority of the Nuremberg Code on medical experimentation, I do hereby exercise my right to refuse to submit to 
or administered COVID-19 experimental gene therapy injection, heretofore known as the COVID-19 vaccine. The United States government has exter extraterritorially prosecuted, convicted, and executed medical doctors who have violated the Nuremberg Code on medical experimentation. Aiders and abettors of Nuremberg crimes are equally guilty and have also been prose prosecuted, convicted, and executed. Every court of law in any lo location has original jurisdiction to hear and try crimes against humanity and violations of the Nuremberg Code are classified as crimes against humanity, which carry a maximum penalty of death. You are hereby put on notice that any further effort to coerce, intimidate, persuade, trick, or compel me, or I'm going to stick in there anyone, to receive an experimental gene therapy injection, COVID vaccine, or any other medical device, that was the mask, drug or procedure against my, against my will, their will implies you as aiding and embedding in the capital offense of crimes against humanity. I hereby reserve rights to swear to a criminal complaint against you in the nearest available law enforcement agency or court of law. I do not I do not contract you within any way and expressly deny any contractual relationship with you. I re hereby reserve my rights and put you on notice that you may also be liable for civil damages under various tort claims, including but not limited to negligence, fraud, assault, battery, intentional infliction of emotional distress, loss of consortium, trespass, and products of liability. 15 seconds. You are hereby notified of potential liability, and this notice shall serve as actual notice and support of these claims. I know you're in a tough position. I get it. It's a very divisive emotional stuff. But do your research. I beg you. Thank you. John Wichstrom. I apologize if I'm murdering last names. I'm really sorry. Good evening, board. Thank you very much, you guys, for all that you do for our kids, for the school district. As many of you know, I have five kids. Two of them made it through your school so far, and I've got another one in train this year, and then twins after that. The beginning of COVID, I was much like anybody else. Um, currently, I'm fighting cancer. I'm at high risk. Um, as you can see, I'm looking okay. I've survived, but the last year has taught us a lot. We've learned a lot from the last year, and as many people here spoke tonight, there's a lot of science between both sides. Um, kind of where I come from is about three months into the pandemic, uh, we had shut down our church, we had shut down our youth program. I am a youth pastor and associate pastor in New Glarus, Wisconsin. I have about 50 kids now that call that home. Just to kind of give you an idea, that's about 5% of your high school population. All the science that we're basing that's pro-vaccine and pro-masks pro is from the CDC and the World Health Organization is less than 1.5% of the given sample. So I'd like to think that my 5% sample probably weighs a little bit heavier. We opened up our youth group first because of the fact that I serve on two committees that deal with teen suicide prevention and crisis text line. We saw suicide increase 400% in the first two months of COVID. That broke my heart. Despite being at risk, both not only because of cancer, but I have a compromised immune system. I couldn't idly stand by and see kids who are secluded and masked continue to degrade in their well-being. It was amazing to me when we opened up. There was a lot of fear. There was fear on my side. There was fear on everybody else's side. We put in good protocols. Masks were optional. Why? Because by state law, I can't ask someone why they're not wearing a mask. If you look at the mandate, you can't ask them. So if they showed up without a mask, I couldn't ask them. It states right in there underneath the executive order. We did take temperatures at the door, and we did ask symptoms. We've had zero outbreaks both in our church and our youth group. We saw the youth group pick up in numbers. We start out with 12. We're about 40 to 50 on average every week. No sickness. There's a lot to be said about what's going on, it seems to be a lot of fear and anxiety behind it. But the truth of the matter is, is I believe that the kids' emotional well-being is far better. We've now seen in new studies that just came out in these regions in which they're masking compared to non-masking, we're seeing a 177% percent 
increase in suicides over non-masked schools. 177%. That's pretty big. Someone was citing the CDC. When we talk about masks, it seems like we automatically correlate it with the vaccine. Did you know never in history have the government ever mandated employers to have their employees get a vaccine of any type? It's always been optional, and now we see at the, at the house right now, it's knocking on the door. That's going to be mandated. But I want to talk about what are we talking about when we talk about these kids. Not only their well-being, but we look at the death rates. And I don't like talking about death rates. But according to the CDC, as of, five, as of the 18th of this month, we've had 296 kids from 5 to 18 years old die of, of COVID. In 2017, we had 528. Of those kids that died, 83% of COVID were obese. But we don't want to talk about that. We'll leave them at home. We won't let them exercise and everything else. We'll mask them up so they can't run. These 40 to 50 kids have been attending my group. Of them, we had 14 of them struggling with suicidal tendencies. Today, we have none. If I can employ you guys in any way, it's to dissolve the fear that's here for today and invest in the mental health of these students for the far long-reaching future. And I would ask that you don't mask the vaccines throughout history have always protected me. I've, it's never been forced on someone else. If the vaccine's supposed to work, it's supposed to protect me. That means even if I'm exposure to someone else, and when we talk about these kids that haven't been protected, the truth of the matter is the CDC numbers, you can go right on there, they have far less chance of dying from COVID than they have from the flu for the last eight years. That's incredible to me. 30 seconds. Thank you. I understand you guys don't have a very, very easy job here. But I think the other thing it can go to show is we're talking about a culture that's so diverse and so split right now. I want to hear about these teachers that are bullying. I keep hearing about these teachers that are bullying other teachers because they don't have a vaccine. They're bullying other teachers because they're not wearing masks outside of school. Look at what we've come to. Mental health should be the top of our list. We're supposed to be educators and encouragers. Thank you. Appreciate time. you guys' time. Kate Noble. Um, hi. First of all, it's not my job to keep you safe. It's not my job to keep you healthy. We're all healthy Americans, and you, I, I'm not qualified to keep you from getting something or you or you. Um, I'm here to to ask for a choice. It's the parents and the children's choice and what they're going to do here. And it is a medical device. And you guys are treading on U.S. constitutional rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. It is hot in here, but you guys are in this hot seat right here. It's not the Green County Health Department that you guys are listening to. It's you guys that are going to be in, that you're going to choose what happens with these children and the parents and everyone else. So I know you guys follow Green County Health Department, they follow the State Department, they follow the CDC, they follow whatever. You guys are you guys are right here. Um, so the PCR tests are unreliable. This is where all of our data is coming from. This is where everybody is getting so much fear that everybody, this one, that one, how many numbers, and checking these Green County Health Department charts. So the PCR test is unreliable, and the FDA is going to end it by the end of the year. And the man that made the PCR test before he passed away right after said, this is not to be used as a diagnostic tool for disease. What are you guys basing it on? I think you're going to have to step away from the PCR test. And I don't know what you got after that. It needs to be a choice. U.S. constitutional rights. Um, and I guess there's a religious exemption that anyone can access. And... Yes, also to the parents, if you don't like what's going on, homeschool. Peggy Hall, thehealthyamerican.org. She has homeschooling things that can be done on your time off and your weekends or uh, Candace One or some other schools. I don't know what else to say, guys, but this is on you. So with that, thank you.
and Chris Schmidt. Hello, thank you all for your service to our community. I think we've got a great community. I think we've got a great school. I've got three students in Monroe schools, um, one in middle school, two in high school now. And we've heard a lot tonight from both sides, and I value both sides' opinions. I value both sides' input. We have personal opinions. We have uh, health officials' opinions. We have government opinions. We've got a lot of opinions. And I just want to, I guess, share some personal things. Uh, I don't have any data with me tonight of, of the CDC or things that have happened, but just personal stories. I pastor here in Monroe, and when the guidelines came through the mayor, or rather the governor, and through the health department, we followed those to the best of our ability. I never mandated anything other than we follow what was promoted. And when that was taken out by the Supreme Court, then I made a free choice. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask if you feel you need to. And I think it should still be that way. Um, personal choice, vaccination or no vaccination. And I certainly think that I agree with so much that's been said with the parents' choice and their students, their children, um, the type of medical attention that they get and things like that with the masks. I do have uh, our middle child, Seth, was exposed to mold at a very young age. He was med flighted to Madison at 10 months of age in uh, the, uh, up there in Madison. He was there, I think, four days and was very, very close. Um, his asthma was never activity induced. It was uh, change of the season induced, you know, foreign stuff coming in. Never through his whole life did we ever say we should put a mask on him in the spring and the fall. But every spring and fall, he would get something. We'd put him on nebulizer and we'd give him different things. But never did we mandate or say, you know, you need to put a mask on. And nobody ever suggested that before this. Um, I have a good friend who pastors in Beloit. And they're very, very strict in Rock County. And he followed all the guidelines. Everybody masked. They social distanced. They kept their um, people that could attend at a certain percentage of what they requested. He had two outbreaks. And he himself also got COVID following every guideline of masks and social distancing and all of that. So from what I've seen, and I think if everybody was honest, everything we've seen, there's people who aren't vaccinated that contracted COVID. And there's people who are vaccinated that contracted COVID. There's people that have worn masks that contracted COVID. And there's people that have not worn masks that have contracted COVID. The only thing we know is that there's a lot we don't know. But the one thing that I'm sure of is that if we act in fear, that's not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and of a sound mind. So I just want to encourage us all, before we react or overreact, that we do follow, you know, what, what I do believe in following the science. I think that it says a lot. Um, but I do also believe in personal choice as parents and uh, students. Uh, as far as uh, the masks and the vaccinations go, I think that should be very much a personal choice. The one other thing that I was made aware of that I did not know is I have two boys in football. And it was uh, at the parent meeting, it was said that if they're exposed and they are not vaccinated, they have to go on a 10-day quarantine. But if they are vaccinated, they do not have to quarantine. And so I asked, well, what if they've already had COVID. Me and my oldest son have already had COVID. We had it December of last year. Um, nobody else in my house got it. When they rode up to Madison together to all get tested, only one tested positive. I don't get it. My wife did not test positive, never has. I got it. Um, so to me, the science says that if you are, if you have natural immunity, then that's good as well. At least as good as they're saying the vaccine is, if not better. And so my question is, and my suggestion is, is that if you're going to have that quarantine, if you're going to do that with unvaccinated students, please consider also those that have already been exposed and have natural immunity and antibodies in their system. Thank you. Um, Kaden Blackburn. Hi, I'm Hayden Blackburn. I'm a seventh grader here at Monroe. 
Um, I know you should listen to the parents, but um, the students go to school. So you should listen to the students. <laughs> Tyler? <laughs> um, I'm Kyler Blackburn. I'm going to be a sophomore here in Monroe, and I would like to share my opinions about wearing masks. Um, fortunately, I was able to do Plan H last year, so I didn't have to wear a mask for like the whole year, like year. But I was lucky enough to get go into band, and when I went into band, I had to wear a mask. And I did not like it. I felt like I was suffocating, and like I was like trapped. And yeah, I didn't like that at all. Um, I also didn't like that I wasn't able to see like facial expressions, like and see people's emotions. Like you couldn't see people smile. And that's like a big part of like who I am. I like to make people smile. And like when you can't see that, it's kind of hard. Um, another point that I wanted to share was when I was in science class, my teacher told me that scientists will rearrange their information so that it fits what they want. So I don't know a lot about like the studies, but I know that it could be a lie if they're changing it. And as I was listening to everyone speak, I realized that a lot of people want the same thing. They want their loved ones to be safe and healthy. So I think that if you allow everyone to make a choice, they can at least feel like they have a part of like making sure that they can make everyone like safe and healthy and make sure that everyone's okay. Thank you for your time. Is there anybody else who would like to make public comment? That was the last on our list. So if there's anybody else who'd like to make public comment, you can come and sign in. Can I say one thing? Two seconds? Go cheesemakers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to thank everyone for coming and and sharing your point of view. Please know that we listened to all of it and appreciate everyone coming and sharing their, their thoughts tonight. So we are going to move to old business. There is no old business. So we're going to move on to um, Northside Project Update. Hi there, for all of you that don't know me, I'm Tony Buss. I'm the project manager for C.G. Schmidt for uh, doing some of the renovation work at the school district at Northside Elementary. So <clears throat> I just give an update every every time there's a board meeting during the summer regarding the progress. So um, Cody was here last time. I know he gave you a lot of updates. So I'm just going to tell you what happened since then and, and what we're what we're going to do here in the next week or so until school starts. So um, of course we had the four major bathrooms um, that we're remodeling the four four quadrants of the building. Um, at that point in time, we were just finishing up some of the taping and mudding. Um, tile was being completed in two of the four restrooms. Ceiling grid was just going in in the first one, and light fixtures were being hung in the first one. So uh, over the last couple weeks, uh, painting is now complete. Uh, tile is completed as of last Thursday. All the ceiling grid and ceiling tiles are done. Uh, light fixtures in and electrical finishes are done. Plumbing fixtures are going in right now. Uh, we do have one potential delay I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, but for the most part, the plumbing fixtures are going in right now. Um, HVAC ductwork is installed and the grills are in, doors and hardware are hung, and toilet partitions have been installed as about 6 o'clock this evening. So that's a good thing to have behind us as well. Um, other thing we got done over this weekend was uh, the cubbies in the kindergarten wing. They are placed, uh, about 140 of them we placed. Those are all installed now. So that was uh, a good thing too because we were at risk of not having those by the end of the summer, so that's good news. Um, 
and then accessories are going in. So I guess what's coming up here are, are plumbing fixtures. Uh, the main thing that will not be in is the, the multi-use wash basin, which is basically a, a multi-person sink outside of the restrooms. Uh, we're going to be putting in temporary um, sinks for those. The reason for that is just the, the supply chain demands and, and, and issues with that. Um, the good thing is there is an actual sink inside the restroom, so the, the students will still have that sink and be able to wash their hands and whatnot, but I felt I needed to at least make everybody aware of that. Um, Today, the punch list was created by architect and the, and the leadership team at the school. Uh, so we'll be working hard over the next couple weeks getting that punch list done. It's pretty much minor stuff, really. Um, and then final cleaning. So um, really, it looks really great right now. The space is pretty much done minus final cleaning and a few things here and there. Um, some signage, things of that nature. So we're going to be cleaning Monday or on Wednesday of this week. We've got a cleaning crew coming in to try to get everything spruced up and uh, available for the parent and, parent and student open house on Wednesday evening. So I think we're in, in fairly good shape. Um, on the exterior then, uh, just to kind of give a little bit update on that. Last time we talked, we were just finishing up some of the concrete work. Uh, since then, not a lot has really happened on the exterior aside from some grass seed. And then we started tearing off and replacing some of the siding. Um, so over the next week and a half, actually, and, and beyond, we will be replacing the siding. Um, that was our other major issue this summer with uh, supply chain stuff is just getting the siding here. We kept getting pushed back. So um, we will more than likely be installing siding past the first day of school. But we have been communicating that with the leadership district or the school. And uh, everybody's got a plan to uh, to make that as least impactful as possible. And if we need to change that plan, we will. Um, so, again, it's not a surprise to the, the team. It's just, you know, we're working as hard as we can to get it done. Um, other than that, though, I'd say everything went great this summer and things are, are looking good. So I think the staff and people that have been in the school district are, are happy with the way things are looking. So um, with that, does anybody have any questions? So you mentioned some supply chain back orders, um, even though we've run into a couple of them. Are the, are the amount we're seeing consistent with other jobs that you guys are doing right now? Yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of things that just aren't coming and being delivered as quickly as they once were, right? Right, exactly. So these things that, that are a problem right now, I've had commitments on those to be here at a sooner date. So everything on other jobs and other projects, we're hearing similar stuff. It's just a different thing a lot of times. Uh, there's no predictability. Um, you know, most times you can trust delivery dates and things of that nature, but lately I've been seeing a lot of things that just they go past the delivery date without much explanation. Um, you know, there's reasons behind everything, and we try to get down to the bottom of it. But just industry wide, yeah, you, you, we see a lot of that right now, and it's just all over the board. I'm hearing that about school construction projects throughout uh, the region in the Midwest. It's, yeah. it's not, it's very common right now yeah. that we're seeing that. Uh, as far as Meet the Teacher Wednesday night, we're going to be all set, all the cleanup will be in place, so we won't have any, you know, problems with that. There's still some. Work that's going to be done outside of those hours, but it's not going to interfere with Wednesday's Northside Meet the Teachers night. And, you know, some of the fixture installation can occur outside of school hours, right, after. So, so we won't be doing any of that work during school hours and interrupting instruction, but some of it might be done afternoons, weekends, et cetera. Um, with, with the exception of maybe the siding, as long as we work out a plan right. so that the noise level is. We did some testing today on some of the noise levels, some of the tools. There's a couple of teachers in the office. And they're out in their classrooms today. So um, we're very aware of that, and we obviously will work around your schedule to do whatever we have to do. And certainly, if we have any feedback that the noises are, you know, particularly distracting, we'll work with CG Schmidt and just have them reschedule that work or move to a different part of the building. So, any other questions? All right. Thanks, Tony. All right. Thank you. So, no action there, but next on the agenda is the COVID-19 protocol amendments. So, Rick, I'll let you talk about the, um, the amendments that you made to our plan. Right. So, there were three uh, amendments that were brought up by board members in the previous meeting, and some people in the audience may have watched that meeting online, some people may have been here, uh, but after the last meeting, the board asked for three potential amendments to what's in place right now for the COVID guidelines. 
The first amendment we'll be talking about, amendment number one, would be an amendment to require mass grades pre-K five, and that would require a motion and a second. Um, and uh, certainly could, that motion could be amended if somebody wanted to add or subtract dates or time periods. The second amendment, amendment number two, and we're going to refer to these by those numbers. Amendment two <laughs> is, a member, is an amendment to not quarantine individuals that wear masks. So we'll talk about that. And then the third amendment, one which I don't think really has any controversy to it whatsoever, is an amendment to approve guidelines for outdoor activities. And that would be an amendment that um, uh, a motion would be made to approve the guidelines for out outdoor activities, which doesn't require masks. So uh, that obviously I don't think will garner a great deal of debate. So um, first on amendment one, and Teresa, I don't know if you want me to start with my recommendations and if you just want to kind of uh, open discussion if, with the board. I was just going to say yes, if you could make your recommendations. And do, does everyone have the, I mean, access to the protocols, right? Okay, so yeah, okay. you can make your recommendation and then you can Yeah, so everybody on the board has, should have the electronic documentation that's needed, and if not, certainly ask a question. So um, as far as amendment number one, um, you know, I probably have talked to at least half the people uh, who've made public comment tonight uh, on either side of the issue. So I'm fully aware of uh, how polarized this issue is. And, and everybody, um, you know, is passionate about this that uh, has an opinion. And I respect that. And I think that board members respect that. And individual conversations with uh, board members have with me, uh, we, we frequently talk about the, uh, the raw emotion that people are uh, approaching this situation with. Uh, from my perspective from the beginning, there's two ways you can approach uh, in a situation like this. You can approach the situation with blanket mandates, or you can try to use what you think you've learned thus far and approach a situation by following some local data. Um, I have been very frustrated by the CDC, particularly this summer. Um, it had been brought up that uh, some significant guidelines had changed uh, three times in the last month, and that's true. And it's created a moving target for us that organizationally is very, very difficult to work through. I very much understand that things change, but on the flip side of that, um, when things change to the point where setting policy becomes very difficult for the board, um, you know, it, 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 it really becomes difficult to manage and run a school district. I don't think there's anything the board could come up with that's going to make everyone in this room happy. And uh, somehow along the way in this situation people have lost the ability to even listen to or acknowledge other people's uh, debate. Uh, I appreciate that the comments tonight were civil. Many school districts are not having civil discussions about this as has been exemplified throughout the state and I'm glad that uh, the public comments this evening were civil and I certainly hope that the board debate uh, is uninterrupted and allowed to be board debate uh, as we've taken the time to listen to everybody. Um, as far as the pre-K-5 uh, mandate, I'm opposed to a pre-K-5 mandate, a blanket mandate um, requiring masks. I disagree with many of the people who spoke tonight to say that two things. Number one, we can't require masks. Yes, legally we can. And number two, I disagree that there's not a time when you have to ask serious questions about whether the disease is spreading at a rate that's uh, unsafe to students, staff, and even the community. Uh, there were a couple times last year, when, even when we were masked, where we had some pretty substantial spread in buildings and we actually shut down. And that's the last thing I want to do this year is shut down. I, you know, I would prefer to have in-person instruction every day and I would prefer to have uh, as many kids in school as possible. And truthfully, with as polarized as people are on this issue, I don't see a way to get as many kids in school as possible by making a blanket mandate. So I still believe there may come times during the year when we see the spread and the number of cases and the number of quarantines to the point where I don't believe it's manageable. And I think it's my job when it's not manageable to make the decision that superintendents have to make and come up with a short term solution. This year when that would happen, I would propose that we follow it up at the next board meeting and have discussion about the numbers that led me to that decision and then the board can either endorse or not endorse the decision that I have made. I think that's the way to go about this and you know, I hope that people would have understanding, patience, kindness and I hear a lot about love of parents and love of children and freedom and I 
believe all of those things. I'm a parent, and I believe it or not, love my own children. Uh, but the reality is, but the reality is, we're not going to find common ground. So at some point, somebody has to be the adult, and somebody has to make the final decision about where we're going. Um, I believe that in this particular instance, um, I think the approach that we plan to take is to look at the data, and if things get out of control, we may make adjustments. They will be short term. We'll come back to the board, and the board can either decide to agree or not agree with the short term position we take. I hear a lot of comments about the science, and I want everybody to know that uh, I like science. Uh, I was a science teacher for 12 years. Uh, my mother's a retired physician. Uh, lots of conversations with mom about COVID and vaccines and all of those kinds of things. The reality is anybody who tells you what the, the correct next step is, is guessing. There's no certainty about what the correct next step is. Uh, I do worry, and I've told the board members this in my weekly notes to the board, I before board meetings, you know, on Friday, provide written notes to the board about the upcoming meeting and where I stand on particular issues. I do have a great deal of concern for pre-K-5 parents who have immunocompromised children and are worried about their health and safety. That keeps me up at night. But on the flip side of that, we need to try to get as many people in school face-to-face -face as possible. We learned how COVID spread in our schools last year with masks. We may have to take some time to see how COVID spreads in schools this year without masks. I don't support a blind making masks optional with no ability to look into the future and look at what's happening in our schools and our numbers. And I think people who advocate for that probably aren't speaking out of health and safety. They're probably think, speaking out of philosophy. I love Monroe. I love uh, leading our schools and you know, uh, supporting our children. But the reality is there is no middle ground on this that's going to make people happy. So we have to come up with a situation that we feel is practical. And what I feel is practical is making masks optional, pre-K-12, looking at the data, both in the county and in our schools individually, each five schools. We might have one school where we have 20 cases of COVID, and we might have one school where we have zero. I don't necessarily know if they need to be handled the same. So that's my recommendation to the board. Uh, I am absolutely certain that I will get excessive feedback if and when I decide to choose mandating masks at a site because I don't see another option to slow the spread. Well, I guess the other option would be to just go virtual again. I mean, those are really the only two levers we can pull in that case. So that's my recommendation. Uh, I, I arrived at it with great grief, uh, probably haven't slept more than a couple hours in a couple of weeks. Um, but that's my recommendation. But I certainly understand if uh, board members have a different approach because this is a complex matter. And uh, you know, all we have uh, locally is our data from last year. And our data from last year told us when the burden got over 500, we had trouble, period, end of story. And we know that we had outbreaks when we had masks. It happened. There were times where we had outbreaks that had to make classes virtual and other buildings in the school function completely normally without even a single case. That may happen again. So I'd like to approach each school individually. I would be hopeful that people would have some sense of cooperation if and when numbers get high. And if they don't, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The last thing is, um, our kids were great last year. I don't know how many times I said that. Uh, our kids did a wonderful job doing what we asked of them. In retrospect, I can't tell you if what we did last year was right or wrong, but our kids did a wonderful job, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, a vast majority of our kids will, will do what we ask. That's just the way they are, and quite frankly, we have a lot of really good kids. Um, but I do see the fact that these two positions cannot be brought even to a middle ground. So I think that uh, approaching this from a database perspective and seeing where things go and comparing data from last year to this year is probably our best route. So 
That's my recommendation on Amendment 1, Teresa. So. so what I'd like to do is talk about each amendment um, and make a separate Everybody. motion. So if we can talk about Amendment 1, which is um, the requirement for masks um, pre-K-5. And I guess I just want to clarify, Rick, so what I'm hearing you say is your, rec your recommendation is not a mandate K-5, but you are continuing to recommend that we use this chart. So if the county, if the county data is high and increasing, yeah, stable for, and increasing, masks are required, like that's, so yeah. you're saying continue to use this chart. Yeah, we're continuing. Yes. So for people who've observed the previous two meetings, we talked about burden trajectory and three-day three trends in buildings. Right now we can, we can trace the burden and trajectory in the county because that data is available. What's not available is our trajectory in buildings because we're not the school. We have a limited number of students who are appearing in some schools for individual reasons, probably most at the high school right now uh, because we have a number of our sports and activities that have started. But we really don't have trend data yet, and we really can't have trend data until kids are in school. So, yes, I'm recommending that we still follow that and uh, ultimately... You know, I, I'm sure that this uh, approach is probably dissatisfactory to everyone in the room other than the board, but uh, we've been talking about it for several meetings. And in the end, I think it's probably the best compromise we could work out with perspectives that we can't bring together. Just a question on that, Rick. You had, we had talked about last board meeting, the very high, you were going to mm -hmm. look at that. Has that been revised or? Yeah, so right now on the chart, if for the board members who have it, we still have the stable and shrinking is optional. I'm very willing to move those to required. I'm really not interested in the high adding more because I think that high, that high for those people who are in the audience, that ranges from 100 cases per 100,000 to 350, and that's quite a variance, and it's a variance that's not extremely high compared to what we saw last year when we saw a lot of problems in the county. So I really would recommend that uh, I will move the stable and shrinking, the greens under very high to required, and then the rest would stay as it is. I just haven't changed it yet because I don't know if we're going to go this route. We don't need this chart if we have mandates. Oh. Well, you still would need it for if we did. Yes, eight, for high school and middle school. school. Yeah. Unless somebody had a pre-K-12 mandate. So. So I will. I was just going to say, what I does anybody have any? I guess I'll open it up to anybody who has any any conversation that we want to have um, thoughts. Yeah, you want to go down? Well, I was going to say, um, apologize for not being here on time. Uh, I had the city mineral <clears throat> meeting, and so we were also talking masks, vaccinations, things like that as well. But um, Rick. Even if we didn't make it, you know, you just talked, I think you made it, mentioned it a little while ago. If one of the schools had some trends that you were concerned about, you would, you could, you could mandate grades, right? You could say, hey, there's been five cases that popped up just overnight in second grade. All second graders are going to wear masks. I mean, it could be that specific, right? It possibly could. I mean, I think in the elementary, you have a much more stable student interaction pattern, you know, because kids stay primarily with their homeroom teacher. And when they venture out, you know, it's only for usually one or two specials a day and maybe, you know, outdoor recess, et cetera. So that's possible. I think once you get to middle school and high school, the, the, the class schedule pretty much makes that an impossibility. So, yeah, I mean, I think you could be targeted depending on if you had an outbreak. Uh, for those of you um, who remember last year, we actually, you know, our patterns in our elementary tended to follow grade levels. We typically had a problem grade level. And part of that is just how the students interact. They're much more tied into their grade level than they are in other grades. So I think it's a possibility. I, I think it's the issue is, and I think we learned this last year, is that as soon as we, as soon as we make a hard, fast rule, we have to change it. Because, you know, things pop up, you know, and we, there's things we don't recognize. And the reality is, if we don't mandate masks, we may see the same pattern of transmission, or we might see a different one. And I think that we have to be open to those possibilities. So I'm answering your question as a possible yes. Um, the goal is always going to be to, to restrict as few people as possible so we can have as many people come to school. The reality is 
I know there's some people who are so passionate about this on both sides of the equation who are, you know, believe me, I've had endless feedback in the last month about who's all going to leave school. Um, the reality is um, people should think long and hard about making decisions abruptly about their, their children's um, education because as a guy who's moved around and moved my family a few times, there's, there's costs every time you make a, a decision like that. But the reality is, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, approaching this from a data-based approach is really the only way that I think at some point we could get people to, on both sides of this issue, at least understand that we're trying our best. So. Well, and, and I, 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 have a, I have a child in this category, too. So it, it really, it, you know, if it, it affects me quite a bit. And I, I stay up night two thinking about this. Um, and I think this is one of the harder decisions we're going to have, that I as a board member probably have to make, at least in the last couple of years, even with everything that we've gone through. Um, at this point, one thing that bothers me, or not bothers me, concerns me, is getting a, my son getting exposed and having to, you know, either, even if he doesn't come down with it, 14 day or 10 day quarantine. It's tough on family, it's tough on me. But um, I want to, I'm more concerned about the, the transmission um, from kids to each other and kids to the parents and family members, grandpa and grandpas. But I do see both sides of this. And I guess I probably will um, fare on the side of what you, you were recommending uh, as a database approach. Um, I have faith in you even though I'm putting more stress on you, um, to act in a very quickly and responsive way. I think you've demonstrated that all last year, that you had no hesitancy to shut down a school or, you know, uh, err on the side of caution to protect our kids. Um, and so I guess that's kind of where I, I, I lie right now. I haven't talked to Rick on this personally myself, too, and I, I am where work is right now, too. Um, and I, I thank everybody for coming and, and having a voice. Um, you all matter. Um, it's a tough decision. And um, and we do have things in place. We go by the data, and you know we can go to school, look at each school we, if things come up. But to have, um, I think we should stay at the K, P, pre-K through 12, not, you know, not making it a mandate. <coughs> Yeah, I was going to say, you know, no one on this board and and no one in this district wants kids to be unsafe in any way. Um, Ayoko Cheryl, thank you for all coming. This is is hard and difficult, and all of your opinions matter, and we appreciate hearing them. And we listen. I think one of you asked, did you read my email? We read all of them, and and we we take all of it into, into account. Um, with that being said, Everyone's version of what safe looks like in this room is different. And so I like, um, you know, last year, and I, I tend to be very consistent in, in my approach to looking at things and how I, how I look. And last year, I asked for us to let kids try to play sports. Let's try. If we need to pivot, we'll pivot. But at least we can't look at our kids and tell them we didn't try to get them to, get them to try and be able to play. I think this is, this is no different. We can't look at any of these kids and tell them we didn't try to get you all back to school. And I think that's that's really important. Um, I also feel very confident, and I watched Rick last year go in and out of plan as we needed to. Um, he is closest to the data, and I trust that. And so I, I continue to support Rick's recommendation to not mandate uh, at this time. But I also hope people will respect that if we need to, we will. And that's where we are. But at least we've made a, a critical decision with the data. But we've tried. So that's that's where I'm at. Um, I think the most positive and strongest thing I heard tonight was came from a student. And I think she hit it right on the head that whether you're on either side of what um, we are talking about, we all loved our loved ones, and we just want to keep them safe. And as parents, I feel that we have that choice. We have that choice on how our 
children are protected. So I feel comfortable with the adoption that we had on July 26 protocols with keeping it as a um, not mandate. But I agree with the rest of the board that if it comes to the point where the numbers are high per school per grade, that we look at that and Rick can take action at that point. Getting our kids back in school is a very high priority. And I believe um, a part of that is also their mental health it needs to be looked at and reviewed. So um, this mask mandate has divided families and communities and schools for quite a while now, and it's gonna continue. I don't see it going away at any time soon. So the best we can do is be kind to each other. We each have our side and we each have our choices, but I believe in keeping it with optional. You have the choice to wear a mask if you choose to. And going forward, I believe that's what's best at this point. You're saying optional with, with um, you're saying optional with Rick's, with that recommend. So when it's yep. hot, you know when those burn together. Following Rick's recommendation. Yep. And I do want to make a comment. There were several comments made this evening that the board doesn't have the authority to mandate masks. I just want to step in and indicate with absolute certainty from our legal counsel, the board has the authority to mandate masks. They absolutely do. Um, we absolutely do. Now, it doesn't mean people like it, but we have the legal authority to do it. And certainly we're in a good place legally if somebody you know provides a legal challenge, it um, doesn't mean people like it. That doesn't mean people agree with it. But as far as the authority to do so, we have the authority to do so. So I just want to make that very clear because that's been represented uh, several times in this meeting, and that is a belief that people have, but not one that's going to hold legal legal water. So. And I'll just uh, talk a little bit about where where I'm at. Obviously, I'm. Probably a little bit more, um, you know, I, I think if you look back last year, a couple of my concerns, um, one is we, we're making this mask issue and I don't think it's a mask issue. To me, it's, it's, it's what do we need to do to protect our students in school. And, you know, as I look at what we did last year, I think Rick did a great job of pivoting and moving things around. So I, I do, like we said earlier, I really appreciate how he was able to do that. Um, you know, we have the playbook. We did it last year. I think we were fairly successful overall in keeping our kids in school. And I hope I'm wrong, but, you know, if we don't implement all our protocols, my biggest concern is one of our goals was always to keep the kids in school. And from what I'm seeing in the numbers and not knowing what might happen with you know, a lot of the protocols we had last year, we don't have. We're not going half and half, right? So we're going to have more kids in the schools. Now you take another parameter out of mass. Again, all of these things were layered approaches to keep people safe. My concern is we're going to be right back where we're at and having kids out of school. So um, although I would probably like to start at least, in mass for a month to see where the numbers go. Um, I also know Rick with his protocols have, he has that ability to do that if he sees a problem or issue. And I would support that. Dylan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think I agree with Rick's plan based on data. I think right now it's not necessary to mandate based on where the numbers are. Um, I agree that Parent parental choice is a big, big deal. Um, but also, if we get to an issue where we either have to close school or mandate masks, I think masks are definitely the better choice because we want the kids to be in school as much as possible. And I will share that Phil can't be here, is not here tonight, but he has indicated that because masking, you know, seems to be a divisive issue with strong feelings. Um, he is, he is agreeing with Rick's recommendation um, for this as well. And then um, Rich similarly said, 
um, that he's feeling, you know, similarly. He also really highlighted the fact that he likes the database decision approach where we are really looking at not just, you know, overall, you know, blanket approach, but local data, school-wide data. Um, he did mention, he does have a caveat in here that he feels that because we can't have, because we are currently high and we can't have some of that data, he is suggesting that we start the year as if the, the trend was increasing, making an assumption that the, the trend was increasing. Um, so that the year would start K K five with masks pre K five pre sorry pre K five with masks um, because that's what would happen if we were high and, and the trend was increasing. We just don't have that trend. Um, so he's saying make we're, he's he's saying because we don't have that data piece to make that assumption. Um, so that's that's where that's at and and I guess. Um, I wanted to make sure I share that, but also to say again, echo what people said, I really appreciate everyone being here tonight. I, I appreciate everyone's opinion. I appreciate everyone coming to talk. Um, Nikki mentioned, you know, we've gotten lots of emails and we absolutely read all of them. Um, and for me, um, like Dan, I have a, a child who's also impacted, but, um, you know, we are all here <laughs> doing this because we care about our communities, we care about our kids, we care about our families, we care about our schools. And I know that in person, having our kids in person is critically important and um, making sure they're safe and taking care of their social emotional well-being is also critically important. Um, and I feel um, a strong responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything we can. And it I know, I know this is just a, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we're, that I know that we're not all going to come together and agree, but I also echo what, um, what Rick said, that people were respectful and kind, and I think that speaks a lot to the community that we are. And I do know that um, at the end of the day, we're going to come together and we're going to work for our kids and we're going to do what we absolutely, absolutely think is, is best for everybody, given the wide range of beliefs and values. Um, so given that, I and, and I also agree that Rick did a fantastic job last year in monitoring the data. I think he, he lived and breathed it 24 hours a day constantly. And so I like the idea of adding those two requirements that you, that you mentioned um, to make sure that then masks are required. And um, I would also, I would also be okay with, with, um, Rich's recommendation of, of assuming um, an increasing trend to start pre, um, pre-K-5 with masks, assuming, because that's, we're, we're almost there anyway. Um, so I would be okay, but I, but again, I, I support Rick's, um, you know, recommendation to be able to monitor those and to be able to use local data to make decisions. So, as a matter of procedure, I think there's a couple options. I mean, uh, there's a there's a motion to require mass that creates pre K five. So, if somebody wanted to make a motion, it would require to have a second, and then ultimately, if there you know if there wasn't a motion and a second to get it on the table, we would just revert to where we were on July twenty sixth. I'd make that motion to not require mask at grades pre K five. I'll second. I guess. I so I have a question. I do yeah, want clarification on this too, yeah. because that's kind of a blanket statement as well. So that almost kind of counterdicts what Rick would say. Mm -hmm. Rick would, because that that this is an amendment to our previous policy. The previous policy said that Rick could make them could make them uh, required. And what you're saying is to not require them. So that really takes that out of Rick's control. I just want to make sure I'm understanding that motion. That's, a, that's the way it was worded in here, so we need to word that differently then. I know, so, I, know I understand that, I but think, I just want to make clear. Yeah, so what I guess I was saying is if, if you want to keep it the way it was in July 26, it doesn't require a motion. Doesn't require a motion. I think if you want to mandate masks oh. pre-K-5 or for a period of time, if you wanted to mandate masks for a set period of time with a, you know, a date to revisit it, it would require a motion. So we have require or not require in blue on your sheet, but the reality is 
did not require, there's really no reason for it because on July 26, we had masks optional with a data-based approach. That's what was in our protocol. So we don't need a motion. I think what Dan was clarifying was that whether you make a motion to require or not to require it, then kind of potentially takes the data component out of it. So you're, right. if you're wanting to maintain that, you're better off not having a, a motion to amend where you guys have discussed it. Previously. And since the motion's on the table, we would be looking for someone to either withdraw the original motion or uh, then we would have to vote on the motion. So I'll withdraw that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, you have to use you would take away your you second? Take away your second? Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's no motion. So that means it's going to stay. Yeah, unless somebody wants to make a motion to mandate masks. Do we need to do anything to make any changes to the chart? I think I've received feedback that uh, people at the very high level wanted the uh, stable or decreasing when things are stable or shrinking to be moved to from optional to required. And I made that move live on your chart if you're looking at it while we're meeting. So. That would be the guidelines I would be following once school started. And what kind of uh, timing are you thinking like that? So this, I'm looking at the numbers, you know, we were at 51, 54, 116, 189 for a burden rate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that trend would continue. Well, if that trend would continue, it would take, you know, we would be at very high probably in a month, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and for, you know, people who are familiar with these numbers, the two-week rolling average really softens both the acceleration and the deceleration. So when numbers drop, they, the, the burden and the trajectory drop slower, more slowly, and vice versa, then they, they raise uh, kind of in a, um, you know, level pattern too. So, yeah, it's very possible. And, you know, that's where, I mean, um, you know, I think that uh, it's possible that we could see some, you know, higher numbers and, whether that's the case of, uh, you know, whether people are wearing masks or whether it's the variant, the Delta variant or whatnot, I mean, you know, I guess we're going to find, you know, if we if we use this approach, we're going to find out in due time. So. And I guess I was looking more for logistics, like what would that look like? So if it hit. Yeah, so if a decision had to be made, obviously it would be no different than when we made decisions on phases last year, plans, right? I would. Start out by letting the principal know that they were, you know, that we're seeing concerning trend in their building and that ultimately we might have to make some modification, which would be followed by parental notification of the status and what the remedy would be. And we really only have two remedies right now. And that would be to require masks or go to virtual instruction. I mean, there really isn't anything else when we're at full capacity and we're really not prepared to go to half capacity again because that's a whole logistics mm -hmm. breakdown that's, you know, pretty substantial. Um, so I guess that answers the question. I mean, those are really the, the only two levers we have to pull or push are those two factors. Uh, so so I, I want to clarify something. Let's just say we're in, in the moderate or even a low, and all of a sudden, and this says optional, mm -hmm. and you see an alarming trend at one of the elementary schools. Yeah, I would react, I would we're, react accordingly. This isn't the sole data that you're going to use. No, absolutely. I'm just put that out there that there is, this is, obviously this is going to be a main tool for you, but if you see all the alarming concerns, you're going to, you're going to act and then bring back to us at the next board meeting. That's correct. So we never are going to, so the longest time period we would have between a decision and a public discussion about it where people could come watch it or listen or whatever is going to be the distance between the time a decision is made and the next board meeting. Typically, it's a two-week cycle. We have a few months of the year where it's three because, you know, we have a, you know, a longer gap between the uh, fourth Monday and the second Monday of the next month. Sometimes that's a three-week gap. But in generally speaking, it's going to be less than two weeks. And, and sometimes it's a couple days. And I appreciate that. And my other thing is, last time I think, you know, you talked about these um, ones in the high and very high, switching them to required. Do we need them to... Make a motion to approve that? He okay. just said no. So he that's, no. Yep. that's just no, this is just a worksheet. It's not actually in the plan. Okay. The board approved the plan on the 26th of July. They did not approve this chart. That's right. That's right. Thank you. No, this is just a this is just an advisory chart like every other chart and map that you see on the internet. There's lots of them. They have lots of pretty colors. Okay. Good. So I just want to make sure I was understanding. Thank you. But I think it's important to know. So right now, like if we were starting school, we are in our current count, we are in We're high. in high, we're in stable, uh, so we're in high as a yep. 
100. County, we're in stable as our trajectory, and we don't have a three-day trend because kids aren't in school. So it's so I think um, right. So we're high, we're stable, and if we were decreasing, there you know masks would be optional. But at that at that level, just so people know, if we were increasing, if our trend was increasing, masks would be required. So we're kind of right there. Yeah, it, it really depends on you know what what kind of trend lines we would see when school starts, and you know. Um, you know, I don't think going from, in my opinion, going from one case to two and then the next day still having two is it's far from an increasing trend. I think that we're seeing, you know, when we're talking about increasing trend, we're talking about numbers that are clearly growing and that, the, you know, the, the trend line is taking us to a place that we don't want to see where the curve stops. So, and again, I, you know, I'm going to emphasize that there is going to be some subjectivity to this until the next board meeting. But the next board meeting, the board can always decide, you know, whether they, you know, agree with the route we've taken or not. So I think ultimately, if we, if somebody would want to make a motion to require mass pre-K five, uh, now would be the time to do it, unless we have additional questions. And if we don't hear a motion, then I think we can go on to amendment two. Um, I'm sorry, but we're not taking questions from the audience. Nope, that's okay. Um, Anybody want to make a motion comments? or have a question or comment? So the next piece is hearing none. Is that correct? Um, the next piece is to is the quarantining of individuals that wear masks. All right. So. Um, I've had conversations with lots of people about this and you know the purpose of quarantine from my perspective is to remove people from those close contact situations so they don't spread the disease further in buildings quarantines you know far predate covid they've been used in a wide variety of infection control mechanisms and in general they work by trying to get people close to the source um, removed um, there was a question for uh, the last board meeting, amendment number two, not to quarantine individuals that wear masks. And I'm opposed to this. And the reason I'm opposed to this is I actually believe quarantines do work. Uh, we can go through the semantics of you know, how, impo how important we think or how dangerous we do or don't think COVID is. But quarantines have been long used for infection control and quarantines work. So I really don't think that we want to make an, you know, a change to quarantines based on whether people wear masks or not. The reality is uh, we had people wear masks uh, who got COVID last year. Uh, I was one of them. Uh, and, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I think that, um, you know, if people um, want to wear masks, I think that it isn't. I don't, I don't agree that there's no protection coming from a mask personally. But at the same time, I also don't feel that um, excluding masked people from quarantine is just a good safety protocol for our schools. So I'm opposed to it. So just so I'm clear, if they're vaccinated and they're close contact, they don't quarantine. But that's where we are. Masking, that's where we are right now. Okay. Yes. So this is just of masking, masking. This is just this is just about masking regardless of the mask. That is correct. That's what I was asked to prepare for this meeting. So again, if nothing changes, we do nothing with this. That would be correct. Then, we okay. would still be quarantining everybody within six feet. And Sam Kugley's here, and uh, we talked about following the CDC guidelines. And you know, some people said, "Well, why do you pick some CDC guidelines and not others?" And the answer is because some of them we just can't pull off. And the quarantining was one of them. So Sam, do you want to talk about why we decided to stick with six feet, and why you and I just both decided that the masking, uh, the not quarantining masked people was not a good idea? Yeah, the um, recommendations, sorry, is it okay if I say sitting? Uh, the recommendations from the CDC, which came then through DHS and the county, um, were very confusing. Um, zero to three feet, masked or unmasked, then it was three to six feet, and it was six feet or greater, and um, the logistics of that were going to be very, very challenging, um, and it just made sense because we already have a lot of pressure on our teachers in the classrooms and when I'm looking at quarantining individuals 
um, and identifying those close contacts, I'm relying on our teachers who are also trying to teach our kiddos. Um, so that was just a direction that we decided to go. So we thought that just sticking with six feet is just because it's a lot easier to contact trace. We're not automatically quarantining entire classrooms this year, and I don't know if people caught that from the guidelines, but we're going to try to contact trace the littles, the elementary kids this year. That's going to be hard because their patterns are a little less predictable than middle and high school kids. So um, we're going to try it. Uh, some school districts aren't. Some school districts are still quarantining entire elementary classrooms. Well, we're going to try to do the contact tracing, but we just want to use one physical distance and just leave it at that. So. And we know what six feet looks like. We've done that for a year. So, so yeah, I'm opposed to this amendment because I think quarantines do work. I have a question, Rick. So when it comes down to the quarantine and we have to do the contact tracing, this is more for the middle school, high school level. How do we know or what proof do we get that uh, students that are 12 and up and staff have been vaccinated? Do we just ask to see a card? Do, do we take their word for it? Well, it's, it's different for students and staff. So you want to explain WIR and how that works for students, and then we'll talk about staff. So we have access to the Wisconsin Immunization Registry for students. When you take your children in and you get vaccinated, um, you are giving permission or declining permission for your child's um, vaccination records to be on the state website. So we do have access to that information as long as we're not sharing that information with everybody of who has what and who doesn't. Um, if you have um, signed a waiver where that information is not available to us in the Wisconsin Immunization Registry, then we would be asking for proof of vaccination. Um, and that would be the same for our adult staff. Yeah, so for the adult staff, everybody who was vaccinated by the county at the clinics that were held at school, um, they all signed up through us. Obviously, we have full knowledge and disclosure of who participated. Uh, if anybody else wanted to disclose that they were vaccinated, we would ask them for their vaccination card or their my chart or whatever mechanism they use to do that. And we, would, we don't ask them to do that. They can volunteer that. Why would they volunteer it? Well, because it might affect some workplace matters and that would be from a staff standpoint. But for students, really, there really is very little guesswork to it. The only guesswork would be when parents had had their child vaccinated but withheld their name from the Wisconsin Immunization Registry. And I will say that that is extremely uncommon. It just doesn't happen much. I have a question for either Sam or you, Rick. If now we're talking middle school, high school kids that have been vaccinated, and the kid right next to him they spent an hour with came down with COVID. So my child has been vaccinated, doesn't have to quarantine. But do I get no notified that my child was within distance so that maybe I put that child in a mask or? Yeah, we're going to notify all close contacts. And I don't know where anybody ever got the perspective that we weren't going to do that. Um, that's just not true. We never even talked about it. Um, yeah, we're going to. You know, we're going to contact close contacts because some people are going to do just what you said. Some people might be of the mindset that, you know, they still want to get tested. And, um, you know, that's certainly their choice. And ultimately, we're going to we're going to inform all close contacts that we get through our contact tracing. You know, one of the things that's uh, going to be more challenging for us this year, and I just have to be very honest to the board, all of our health assistants are, you know, 27 and a half hours a week. And we do that for cost control. And then, uh, obviously, if they go past 30 hours, then, you know, there's a lot more benefits that we have to pay and whatnot. Well, last year it worked fine because we were face-to-face -face four days a week, so we had our health assistants uh, all the time we needed them. Moving to five days a week, it's going to be a little bit more of a strain on Sam because our health assistants won't be working all day in our building. So, you know, hopefully there's less contact tracing, but, the, you know, we're prepared for the fact that it's going to be, there's going to be an additional burden on the health health assistants and health staff. And, you know, if at some point we feel we need more help, we might have to reach out to the board and say that we need more contact tracing help for the remainder of the year. Because when somebody tests positive in a school, it, there's a lot of work that comes with it. And I don't think, 
you know, there's a, you know, I think the board appreciates because we talked about it last year, but I don't think a lot of the general public knows how much work's associated with somebody testing positive. And I get feedback from people who say, well, just don't do it. Just don't quarantine, just don't contact trace, just don't do it. Well, that's probably, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that and I don't think really anybody's doing that here. Um, so, but it's a, it's a time consuming process, especially now at the elementaries. Last year, we just said the whole class goes home. Now we're gonna talk to Timmy and Sue and find out who sat with them at their table and reading class and who was sitting next to them and math class. And you know, it's, just, it's gonna take more time. The trade off is hopefully we can have more kids in school because the kids who weren't, who weren't close contacts can stay face to face and, and that's a good thing. So for me, it's time well spent, but it's just time that we have to spend doing it. So non-action on this item indicates that we will stick with the quarantine, quarantine guide. guidelines previously established. Anybody gonna make a motion? Also, I'm gonna say both Phil and um, um, Rich did not want to make any changes. So the third thing is to look at guidelines for outdoor activities. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of controversy to this one, but it will require a motion because we don't have in our we don't have in our COVID guidelines that outdoor activities are mask optional. When we approved it, we just simply didn't include that. We talked about it, but we just didn't have it in writing. So this would be an amendment to the guidelines that were approved on July 26th that would say that you know, uh, outdoor activities are mask optional. Now, I will tell you this, and I, you know, went to the football game Friday night, and I believe on our bleachers, and I was looking, you know, as much as I could during when, when the ball wasn't in play, and there were probably a half a dozen to a dozen people who chose to wear masks outdoors, and some of them were students and some of them were adults. Um, actually, I don't think it was any more or less than I've seen in any other public function in the community that I've been at in the last couple months. So, I mean, there are still some people who are going to choose to wear masks even outdoors. That's their choice. Um, but I don't see any reason to require it. And, uh, you know, ultimately, um, I think just clarifying this and having it in our uh, COVID protocols would be a good idea. So I recommend I approve this motion and I'd like to see us just uh, adopt this so that it's in our COVID protocols. I do have a caveat to that, right? Depends on at least for our sports. If we go to some schools that require it, sometimes we may have to do it, right? Is yeah, we have. Yeah, we, that's a good point. So, you know, we're in the Badger Conference uh, for most of our sports, and we're in the Rock Valley for football. Yeah, so a lot of the Badger Conference schools have mask mandates and they're indoor mask mandates, and yeah, people are going to have to wear masks and they won't be allowed to stay at the events if they don't. So people need to pay attention to when they go to visiting schools, what the rules are. Does, that, does anybody have an outdoor mask mandate? I'm curious, because that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, right? yeah, no, I understand. Mandate. And yeah. to my knowledge, to my knowledge, I don't think so. Okay. Um, even at Camp Randall, I don't know if anyone was watching the news this weekend, but they're requiring masks at places in Camp Randall that are enclosed but in the stadium bowl, they're not, so. So, but yeah, for this outdoor activities, you just, people need to be mindful and about, you know, what the rules are at other places. But you do need one for the record for this one. Yeah. Yes. One. I would make a motion to approve or to have um, guidelines for outdoor activities to make masks optional. Second, Cheryl. The motion was made by so, Dan no and seconded by Cheryl to approve the guidelines for outdoor activities. I'm gonna, I won't, I won't say no mask, I'm gonna say mass optional. Yep. As so, mass optional. As mass optional. As mass optional. optional. Thank you. And this would be a roll call vote. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right, Dan Berto? Yes. Absent. Oh, not abstain. Terry Elson? Yes. Teresa Keene? Yes. Thank you, Matley. Yes. Cheryl McGuire? Yes. Bill McGuire? Yes. Bill is absent. Tim Wolf? Yes. 
All right. Can I make one other comment really quick before? Um, just about the whole mask thing. It bothered me when um, we were talking earlier about the mask shaming, and I would believe with our community, I would, I would think that that's not going to happen here, but any individual in this district, like employee, that would be addressed immediately. Correct. Yeah, you know, that so can't happen. Our mental the board members had the op too important. Yeah, the board members had an opportunity to watch my staff listening session that I held last Wednesday. And I talked about my conversations with a California superintendent where they're mandating masks and a Georgia superintendent where they're not mandating masks. And the Georgia superintendent said, you know, the biggest problem we've had that I was surprised by is mask shaming. And he was very intentional by saying student on student, staff on student, student on staff staff on staff, meaning that that was something that was a factor uh, in all uh, in all aspects. And I told our staff in that, you know, if, if some of that's happened, sh you know, th that shouldn't happen. Shame on them. But it was made pretty clear that we're not to do that uh, in that discussion. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I think I was pretty clear in that. And I think that, uh, you know, some staff members uh, we're grateful to hear that because they, you know, they, they do feel at times uncomfortable with whether it's a colleague or, you know, a situation. And then ultimately if there's choice and I was very clear with staff choice is choice. Optional is optional required is required. And that's the rules. So uh, now that we're mass optional throughout the district, I, it's very clear that people should respect others' decisions. Also Rick brought up tonight, and I don't know if you're aware if any of that is going on, are our teachers or our coaches asking about vaccines? Yeah, and that's where, you know, um, the reality is asking an individual, you know, if you did this is, is far different, that's not the way it should be done. If somebody wants to say, hey, you don't, you're not quarantined if you're vaccinated and I'd like you not to be quarantined as a coach on the team, I actually, that's what kind of coach doesn't want players on their team? So, I mean, that is a little bit more general, and certainly that doesn't bother me, quite frankly. I know it bothers some people in the audience. It doesn't bother me because it's not specific. It's not individual medical information. I think that uh, we certainly can, uh, you know, uh, our health services does not reach out and tell people ahead of time what people's vaccination status is, but they do find out when somebody when somebody's positive and we have to do contact tracing, I mean, they're going to find out, and people have to be real about that. So I guess I don't know if that answers. I guess question. I meant to ask them, like, are they like asking in front of everybody? Yeah, that's yeah. just that, not appropriate. That's, no, yeah, that's, that's it's not that's appropriate. Not yeah. So I mean, if that occurs, somebody should talk to the building principal, and then the building principal addresses it. And if they're not satisfied, then they would come to me. So we have a chain of command for those kinds of okay. concerns. I think the bigger thing is, and I think we've talked about this a lot, is making sure those people that choose not to vaccinate know the, know the risks, I mean, there's health risks, whatever, but there's consequences to, to getting quarantined for 10 days, and that could cost them, it was a wrestler, it could cost them, it was pre-season, post -season, right? It could, it could cost, it cost three football games or, or two, or, you know, it, it could have significant uh, um, consequences, especially in sports. Area. It could cost you the musical play if you're in the play, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's why coaches are doing that, right? They're encouraging their, their, their players to, to, to vaccinate, but if you choose not to, I think it's want to make sure that it's knowingly done. Yeah, I, mean, coach, I think that's what coaches are doing. I coach varsity football for 10 years, never during a pandemic, so I can't say with absolute certainty, but, but I, I, I would have wanted to have as many players available as possible. And if, you know, if there was a likelihood that that was less likely, if uh, there was you know, vaccination, I. I would be hopeful that people would do it. I'm just being honest, um, you won't, you're, you're better off with having more players than less. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think people need to make their own informed decisions, and ultimately, um, you know, just like you have the authority to set policy, and that's you know one thing that I, I want to reinforce with the board here is I think there's been some you know suggestions that you can't set policy. That's just not true. I mean, you have the authority to set policy on these matters, and that's why we're doing it. So. Ultimately, there is, you know, probably, a, you know, this is a situation where, you know, we have to have rules. We can't operate a school district where everybody just does what they want on 
many accounts about a lot of things. Um, I understand people with their choices on vaccinations. I, I, I really don't actually you know, think a mask is dangerous, but I do respect the rights of people to make those decisions themselves, at least as long as we can. So there we go. All right, any other discussion on these matters before we move to professional learning communities? All right, so next. I apologize, I do have to leave at this time. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. Cheryl contacted me well in advance, and she's working this evening, so. Thanks, Cheryl. Next on the agenda is the professional learning um, community goals and outcomes. Me. Um, yeah. And Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um, you just I, left me. I'm going to stand over here. I'm back, Todd. I just didn't want to keep coming in and out. In my opinion, if you're having a conversation about COVID, if there's a guy coughing in the corner, there's not much that's more of a distraction than that. So I apologize. I, I watch from the next room. Good job, everyone. So Todd, you're handing out. I'll get started because this has been a long uh, night already. And certainly we want to be respectful of the board and, and understand that, um, you know, you guys put in a lot of work already. But this is a, a topic that uh, the administration is very passionate about. Um, certainly Todd and I are working together closely on this, along with the principals, Rick, even Ron's in the mix on this stuff, having a good time. And this is the culmination of about six years of hard work by our staff. And um, we put a lot of time, a lot of uh, energy, uh, a lot of hard work uh, into this process. And we're at a pretty critical uh, point in our development as a school district. And quite frankly, we're, we're thrilled about where we're at. And uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing this year, because we honestly believe that if we execute things the way we believe we can, we put ourselves in position at the beginning of next year to start to see our student outcomes go up significantly. And that's not just trying to get you guys excited after a long, hard night of, of discussion. Um, we honestly, genuinely believe that we are in a position to really improve uh, the work that we're doing. So we're excited about that. So I've been here 23 years. I've never seen this level of work with this complexity, with this specificity. Um, and so we want to share a little bit of that with you, not everything. Um, but certainly want to talk a little bit about the work that we've done. Make sure that that's on, so we're clicking. All right, Joe's doing that. I'll second. I think um, we are really excited about the work um, that we have prepared for this year and the goals and the priority areas that we've identified, um, and we're excited to get started. And I hope you guys find it refreshing to talk about our work and student learning. Um, it's something a little bit different. COVID. I know it is, Teresa. <laughs> uh, and we know this is a big year, right? We had we had an unusual year last year um, and not a normal learning year for our students. So I think our staff is eager to get back in the classrooms. I think our principals are eager to get back to some normal work related to uh, PLCs, which is professional learning communities. So we're going to give you a little bit of background um, on this work and provide you a little bit of information on what goals and priority areas we have for the year. So let's just start with PLCs. Is, it's not a separate initiative. Um, it's not a program. Really, it's focused on three overarching ideas. It's a focus on learning, it's focus on collaboration, and it's focus on results and being data-driven with your decision-making. And really, at the bottom there, it talks about just how we do business and, and keeping it super simple. It's being really clear with our learning targets for our students informing students of those targets. It's not a secret what we want them to learn. We want them to be involved in that learning. And then we want to use assessments to nurture achievement, to get feedback as we collect information, but give feedback to students as we help them attain those essential learning outcomes. And then really it's about working together. It's working together to help all of our students who struggle or need to be enriched the opportunity to learn. So those are just the four basic principles of how we do business and what PLCs are about. The work that we've done over the last six years 
um, has been on providing our staff PD. We've attended different workshops and institutes. We've brought people in. Um, we've done train to trainer because we have a lot of staff that are doing really great work in the district. And then over the last two to three years prior to last year, we did a lot of work with for all of our courses, identifying mastery standards, unwrapping those standards into learning targets, and then identifying the essential questions that guide our work. And I would say that we started with common formative assessments and we spent some time on that and that will be a big part of our work this year. So that's just a little bit of background and we've been doing this work for the last, I think this is going into year seven. So we're excited about what we have planned for this school year and we're excited to get back to that work. The quote that Joe's gonna put up here kind of captures the shift in education so the professional learning community model flows from the assumption that core mission of formal education is not simply to ensure that students are taught, but ensure that they learn. And that's really what we've been focused on is a shift from not just coverage of content, but really focus on kids learning the essential learning targets and the standards that we want them to learn in each course and show mastery and proficiency on that. And shifting from staff working in their classrooms in isolation and really working together to support all students. So that really captures that. The work that we do is focused on four critical questions. This really guides the work of all of our collaborative teams, real four basic questions. It's what do we want students to learn? That's your standards and your learning targets. Question two, um, which is a tough one, is how we know if they've actually learned it? And that's where our common formative assessments come in. And then questions three and four, which is really the work that we're gonna be getting into this year, is what will we do if they don't learn? And then what will we do if they actually already know it? So that's extending the learn. So those four basic questions guide our work. And really what we wanna make sure is that all of our students have access, not most or not some, but all of our students have access to the learning. And we're really basing all of our systems and support around that. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is that this isn't just a regular ed initiative and then we have a separate set of work for a special ed. Everything that we're doing overlaps. It's all the same work, it's all connected because if we do this the right way, if we answer these four questions, we do honestly believe that all of our students can learn at high levels. The issue has been not that we haven't worked harder, not that we haven't provided resources or not that we didn't have great staff. All of those things were true. We just didn't connect all the pieces in a way that allowed people to do their job effectively. And what we've had, we've done to this point is we've created a system we've built all the parts once we finish this year we can assemble everything so that we're finally ready to get the outcomes that we know our kids need and deserve so all of our staff all of our teaching staff are part of collaborative teams they're all part of a team that does this work and they have a collective responsibility uh, we're working towards having common goals that they're all working towards within those teams and the work uh, which we bulleted up there is really what we see uh, teams working on when they collaborate throughout the week. We know that this year we have Friday dedicated um, every week for early release where staff would come together and really these are the things that we're asking them to do. Now most of our teaching staff and collaborative teams don't just meet on Friday. They're meeting at least one more if not multiple times a week to do this work. It's complex work. Um, it's around the standards. It's around using those formative assessments. It's looking at data together. It's problem solving. It's using each other as resources to determine what are the next best steps to support kids. And that's really the work um, that they're doing when they come together as collaborative teams. Yeah, so when we talk about this has been a six year process, the reason for that is it's not just a matter of putting people in a room and chatting. As Todd said, it's complex. So each of these entail a set of skills that have had to been developed over time. Um, and again, we can't say enough about our staff and their willingness to believe in the vision, to learn some new skills that allow them to do this work. And at times they didn't always understand why we were doing some of these things. The fact that they followed through and did it, and now we're at a, in a position to um, pull this together, I think says a lot about the people that work in this district and their drive to help kids. I'll just add, I think what that does at collaborative work is in three classrooms in one building, it guarantees that all kids in all three of those rooms have access to the same learning outcomes. It also, a work in progress that assures 
three elementary buildings and third grade are all covering the same learning targets and kids are getting the same opportunities. So that work and that collaboration, we hope leads to that guaranteed Bible curriculum. So the culmination of this is uh, one, one district goal that we've developed for this school year. And that's in red at the top. And basically our goal is that by September 1 of 2022, so about a year from right now, our district will have fully implemented a complete and functional PLC framework that will allow educators to utilize meaningful data in real time to inform instruction and respond to indiv individual student needs. And some people might say, well, that's a mouthful for one goal. That seems like a lot, right? What we're saying is we've, we've been trying to build this system. We want to complete it, our PLC framework, by the end of this school year so we can finally make sure that it's functional and working. And what will that allow us to do? Well, it'll basically put us in a position where we can serve each of our kids individually based on where they're at, what they need, so we know how to respond to their learning gaps or their learning needs. That's something that we've never been able to do. And again, that's not the fault of our teachers. It's that we haven't had those systems in place. And now we're at a point where we're going to be able to pull that all together. But in order to do that, there's three primary areas that we need to work on for this uh, for the upcoming school year. And they're listed uh, below the goal. The first is common formative assessments, and you guys have heard us talk about that a lot. And basically what that means is that we need to conduct frequent checks for understanding. Sometimes that's informal, sometimes it's formal, right? It could be as simple as an exit slip, have a piece of paper, you know, I ask a question, ask kids to respond, they turn it in before they leave the class. Teacher takes a look at those and gets an understanding of where the kids are at and in terms of their understanding of some of the main concepts relative to the learning target. Sometimes it's a little bit more formalized where it's common and the teachers get together and talk about this and they build a, a formative assessment. But the whole idea is that as you go along the way, we're checking to see whether or not the kids are understanding what we're teaching. Going back to the quote that Todd talked about, it's not just about us teaching it, it's about whether or not they're learning it. Are they picking up what we're putting down? If they are, great, let's keep moving forward. If they're not, we have an obligation to make sure that those kids get what they need so they can come along for the ride. And that's what common formative assessments do for us. It's the linchpin for all of the work that we're doing. If we do that the right way and make it efficient, um, it'll allow us to be very successful. In order to utilize that information though, we need a management system that will allow teachers to quickly look at that or first input, at, input the information, look at it, understand what those results are telling us so that they can respond effectively. And that's what the mastery management system will do. And again, by the beginning of next school year, we wanna make sure that we've implemented a, a system that allows teachers to use that common formative assessment data to make decisions in real time about what kids need. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. It's complex. Todd has put in an incredible amount of time over the last several months looking at a, a lot of different options. We think we've narrowed it down to something that can work across all of our levels and we're excited about implementing that with the staff. Is that gonna take a lot of staff time and personal that? Yeah, so one of the things that we talk about is making sure, or trying to minimize the amount of uh, data entry, avoiding duplication. At, at some levels, it, it's, it's just required, right? Um, but ultimately, we're trying to make sure that it's an efficient system so that it doesn't interfere with the teacher's ability to, to teach in the classroom. But there's a little bit of work to it, right? And like any new tool, you need to learn how to use it. And once you use it a little bit more, you become it becomes a bit more automatic. But it, it's certainly something that we're going to all have to learn and adapt to. And I would say staff are already doing it, right? right? You know, some of your staff are recording it in an old grade book. Some of your staff have created Google Sheets that are basically doing that work. Um, this would allow us to have a more systematic way of doing that, to be able to monitor learning across the district for any course or any grade level. And then the last one is a critical piece and probably the one that I'm most excited about as the Director of Pupil Services is implementing a time across all of our regular classrooms to make sure that we provide an opportunity for teachers to pause their instruction, use the data that's been gained through our formative, common formative assessments. Um, after looking at that management system, which organizes it and it says, hey, if I'm teaching this class and I know from Nikki down, you guys have it, but these three don't, I now know that I need to do something. I need to respond to your learning needs. 
So I'm going to make sure that we carve out some time within the pacing guide or within the schedule to make sure that we can get you caught up. Because our assumption, what we believe is that all kids can learn. If we understand where you're at and where you need to be, we're going to make sure there's a learning progression in place that we can get you caught up to where you need to be. Now, sometimes there's certainly kids that have some foundational learning issues that need to be addressed, and we have systems built for that. But overall, the vast majority of kids, if we do this the right way, are going to be able to keep up. And I think that's one of the challenges that we've had, not only in our district, but I think in most districts, is that teachers are working really hard. There's a lot of expectations, and they have a lot of information to deliver. But we have to focus on the, learn, the mastery standards and the learning targets that are most impactful for those kids. And if we take the time to make sure that they have those pieces and keep them caught up along the way, we're going to be in much better shape as we move forward. Come on, clicker. There we go. So what we have here is a link, and I'm going to ask Jen to please click on that link. We're going to show you a video that we feel in two minutes captures what we just talked about. And I think it provides a good uh, analogy for the work that we're doing. Um, did that do that again? I just logged us in, so we should be okay. Um, so this is going to be a video by a gentleman named Austin Buffum. Uh, a number of us have been fortunate enough to see him present at some of the Solution Tree PLC workshops. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about his experience as a teacher um, in teaching mathematics versus teaching um, teaching music and how and the lessons that he learned from that experience. So we love that video, and that's a video that's going to be shared with every one of our teachers um, during the in-service week. Many of them have seen it already as we've done some trainings, but we just feel that it captures the whole idea that we're not going to wait until it's too late. You know, you didn't want to wait until the concert. Well, the same should be true of our, our academics. We want to make sure that kids know what's expected of them. We want to provide the feedback so that we can shape their performance and make sure they, were there, they are where they need to be. Um, when it's most important to to demonstrate their proficiency in the performance. So um, I'm just really excited about the work we're doing, and Todd's going to talk a little bit about this visual because it, it represents that work. Yeah, I think this visual really capture captures that video and what we're asking staff to do this year with 
um, having opportunities for kids to um, be retaught, provide enrichment within the unit and not wait until the very end of the unit. So whether the unit is six weeks, three weeks, or it's a trimester class and they're given the summative at the end, we're not waiting until the end of the trimester to decide, oh, this student didn't get it, now what do we do? It's that preventative loop and we're calling it GRT work that's happening within the classroom on a regular basis with teachers gathering feedback through those assessments and giving kids feedback on the learning targets that they've deemed essential uh, for that unit or for the course. So this visual will be used with staff to just give them that idea um, of that loop that happens within the cycle and within the unit. And Todd referenced this before when talking about the mastery management system and the spreadsheets. The same is true of this work. We're not suggesting that our teachers have never heard of this before, or never done it. Many of our teachers do some of this work. What we're trying to do is make sure that it's applied consistently and that there's a system involved in that data is driving that work. So as we talk about, we have one goal, we have three priority areas. Um, yes, there's some work involved, but it shouldn't be so foreign that it's gonna be overwhelming to staff. I, I, you know, one of the reasons we're so confident in our results going up in a, a little over a year to two years is because we believe in our staff. We know we have great staff and we know they have excellent skills. It's up to us to make sure that the systems are in place to support their work. In your handouts that I gave you um, are the three goals that Joe explained. Um, and then we also have additional resource, which we've called our PLC continuum, which is listed up here and linked. We feel like we've been really clear with staff on what our expectations are. What do we need to do within our collaborative teams to help us help accomplish the priority and the overall, overall goal that we've established? So that document that you guys see is what our staff will see, principals will be using uh, to help move these teams along that continuum. Because we have teams in many different places. Not every team is in the same place with this work. Our teams change every year. Um, some are just better about the work and are farther along and need more coaching and support just like we do for kids. So what we're trying to do is really model this for our staff and being super clear on what's essential and then providing them with the support they need to move along it. Up here, um, just some acknowledgments and celebrations. Joe and I um, have been working with a PLC leadership cabinet, which is made up of teacher leaders across all five buildings. Um, we brought them together along the way to gather feedback and to help do this work. And then they're gonna go back to their buildings and be leaders um, in helping the messaging and helping guide specific things related to the priority areas. And they've been great and they've had a lot of feedback and it's been, it's been really important. It's helped shape where we're at. Um, and I just can't say enough of that group of individuals and, and the work that they do. And I think another nice part about it is it gives many of them an opportunity to have some leadership experience when maybe their, their current position doesn't offer that as much as they might like. So it's been a, a great experience and they've been fantastic. That's all we have. Just, uh, so you, you talked about the implementation continuum, yep, right? the implementation uh, continuum um, is in your handout. You a template. I think it, again, it all speaks to the level of work that's gone into this is unlike anything that I've seen in, in my time. And I think it speaks to the dedication of the staff, the admin team, and the fact that we believe that if we do this the right way, it's going to work. And, and we know that's true because uh, we've spoken to countless school districts that have gone down this road before, and they've said, you're this close. Um, and one of the more rewarding things that we've heard um, this summer, and Todd has really been the person that's received much of this, is as we've explored some different tools for mastery management, um, a number of districts have used a variety of tools and they've said, oh, it's a great tool. It does all of these things. And then Todd asked the specific questions relative to this work and they say, oh, well, we, we haven't gotten that far. We would love to do that someday, but we're not there. And as we talk to the PLC leaders, they'll say, you guys are doing the actual work. Most people stop by the time they get to this point. Um, I think the fact that our staff is that dedicated and persistent is something to to truly be excited about. So um, we're excited about this year. Obviously, there's gonna be some other challenges that we have to deal with. Um, but one thing that we learned last year is that we're not gonna um, 
use that as an excuse. We're going to push forward and make sure that by the by the time we get to September of next year, we're a better district. So questions. Um, just a really quick one, and, and, and it might be a, a, a later answer. Are we confident that this important work that we're doing is best suited for a Friday afternoon after a really long week? <laughs> It, and 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 again, maybe that's a to be continued. But that's I just know where I'm at in my head on a Friday afternoon after a long week at work, and this is really great stuff. And I just yeah, will, will that be revisited if it if it becomes some, like you're in charge of this, you'll pivot and it's it's a great question. And I will tell you, I was one of the people that was here when we first started talking about early release for um, doing some of this work, mm -hmm. and the reason we originally settled on Wednesdays was that reason. Okay. Um, despite the fact that we had a lot of parents giving us feedback saying, if you're going to do this, Fridays would be better. It's better for parents, right? Okay. The reality is, yes, there, there's some challenges on a Friday afternoon. I, I will say, and I'm not just saying this to make the board feel good, I genuinely believe that our staff is invested in this work. And they've gotten to the point where not only are they willing to do it, they know they need to do it in order to do their job well. Okay. And so are there going to be days when they're thinking about what they're going to be doing once the clock says quitting time? Absolutely. Um, but I think our, our principals and our building leaders do a great job of making this engaging and shaping the work over the course of the entire week that we'll get the job done. We'll certainly monitor that. Um, we'll certainly have those discussions as an admin team. Um, but at this point, I have such a high level of confidence in our staff that it's not keeping me up at nights. So. And Amy's whispering in my ear over here. <laughs> what um, is she saying? She, I know. <laughs> and we said this before. This work is ongoing throughout the week. So I think there's other things on Fridays, PD, different things that are happening that we're not just dumping it all into Friday either and saying, okay, Friday's your only day that you can do this work. So I think throughout the week, staff will be doing this. I will say... How many cars are in the parking lot over the weekend too for our staff right and if we can sell if you get this work done you know maybe you're not here on a sunday night at eight o'clock trying to put this work together so they're going to do the work regardless we just we'll do a good job of making sure that they use the time on fridays others well we wanted to make this as efficient as possible because we knew that this was going to be a heavy night. Um, you know, I, I had the the opportunity and the privilege to work with with Terry for a number of years, and Terry accomplished a lot in her time. Uh, I just want to compliment Todd. You know, in his short time in this role, he's worked his tail off, um, and his level of enthusiasm has been unbelievable. Um, and the amount of collaboration that the two of us do is is unlike any that I've experienced. So um, I hope you feel our genuine excitement for this work because we we want the best for this district and our, our kids in this community, and we believe that this is the path to it. So if you ever want to talk PLC, <laughs> you call Todd or myself, and we'll sit, we'll sit down and talk to you as long as you want. Um, but we recognize that you know we have to wrap the night up at some point. So. Um, let us know if you have any questions. You'll hear more from us as the year goes on. We'll keep you updated on the work, but we wanted to give you a quick um, check-in with the work. So that thanks for your question, Joe. What, what kind of updates are you playing with this? I mean, would this be something quarterly we'd get updated on? or? Yeah, I mean, if you go back to, if I can get this clicker to work, um, if you go back to... Are we on the right? Can you click on the PowerPoint? Yeah, and one of the things in your handout, there's two different um, parts of the handout. It, it's the kind of overarching goal that's nice and looks nice that Jenny put together. And then there's another document with some like specific action steps in there, Tim, that yeah. identifies like when certain things are going to happen throughout the year. And I think it would make sense for us to come back at some point, maybe not quarterly, uh, but maybe after some of those key action steps to give a report out on here's kind of where we're at with the work. And ultimately, we'll see some of this, with, I mean, through the curriculum committee, right? Like, because, you know, the right. data should suggest that, that our kids are making gains. Yeah. Initially, it's going to be a lot of adult behaviors that we're measuring, right? Those are the metrics we're looking at to make sure we're doing our part to get systems in place. Once we do that, the nice part about this is that we're going to have 
the common formative assessments and the mastery management system to be able to track how well we're doing and look at the responsiveness of the instruction. So that'll be one of the leading indicators and a lagging indicator will be ultimately some of the state tests and the things that we'd like to see bumped up. So um, we're gonna get there confident. I, I don't know that I could have said that after some of the other work that we've done, not that I didn't believe in it, but this is so connected, it makes the, the process visible. It's, you can understand how this is going to affect each and every kid that we serve. I think one thing we did say is I mean, to what Dan had asked earlier about the management system is long term, it's going to help us with some of that vertical alignment too, right? So if you have a classroom of teachers who are working off their own set of spreadsheets all year saying, are these kids making it? Are they not? And then they move on to the next year, right? And they're kind of starting again. Now they'll have a system where they can look in and they can watch and track that kid from year to year to year. And so that's really going to help our students and teachers. Uh, hopefully make sure kids are moving in a more linear fashion. This is why we keep Ron in the room for these conversations. He's not just a numbers guy and a smiling face. I know stuff. <laughs> Listen to it for seven years or six years. Something's <laughs> bound to rub off. off. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. So, again, thanks. Let us know if you have questions. You'll hear more from us as the year goes on. Thank you, Thank you everyone. See your passion for it. Next on the agenda, boardsmanship um, administration. I have nothing that uh, can't wait until our September 13th meeting. I have no Board of Education correspondence. Committee reports. Uh, finance met tonight and uh, reviewed June and July financials. Um, Todd and I met and are working on a plan for curriculum dates and meetings. Okay, so so stay tuned. Night. Yeah, and Rick and I talked today about uh, possible other meeting dates and that first Monday. So I'm going to put out an email to the board to get some feedback on um, alternate dates and would we like to combine some of the meetings on the same night instead of picking another Monday. Yeah, we think we might be able to get it to just the second and fourth Monday and do curriculum the second Monday. Okay. So we're going to get some feedback from you guys and see if you think that would work. Do you have anything? No. Thank you. Um, yes, the Excellence in Education Committee met, and they will be having their fundraiser on December 5th, a Sunday at the MAC. So put that on your calendars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nothing particular. I just... Excited for next week and wish everybody, the teachers and families, everybody a good start to the year. Does that go for college kids yeah, too? Yeah, it goes for college kids okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> college moms. <laughs> 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 okay. Teresa will be representing the board on Wednesday at the uh, st staff welcome. Uh, our first day of in service is tomorrow, but we have an uh, equity trainer joining us um, who's going to be uh, working with our middle school and high school in the morning and then our um, elementary and district office in the afternoon. And then on Wednesday, Teresa will uh, be doing a welcome address on behalf of the board. So looking forward to that at uh, just after 10 o'clock on Tuesday, or Wednesday, sorry. Dylan? 10 a.m. though. 10 a.m. <laughs> Did I say p.m.? No, but. Just in case. We, right now. I'm right? up yeah. at 10 p.m. <laughs> so You'd like to just do a dry run right now, right. feel free. Uh, <laughs> Dylan, do you have anything? And I would just echo, yes, welcome back to all the staff and thank you to all of you, um, the administrative team. I know you probably work more in the summer than sometimes you do during the school year and there's a ton of planning. So thank you for all you've done to get ready for the school year and um, welcome back to the staff and our kids. So it's looking forward to a great year. Any other liaison reports? Oh, see. sorry. Any agenda items for future discussion that anybody wants to put on the agenda? No. And I don't see the press, and I don't see... Angie messaged me that she doesn't have anything this evening, so thank you. <laughs> and I'm looking for one final motion. Who's adjourned?